reading viral books off of TikTok is like playing roulette within an inch of your life. Sometimes you get a cutesy little young adult rom-com and sometimes you get something else. This isn't happening. He growls. I'm your f uncle. And Tiernan responds with, you were never my uncle. You're a no relation stranger my parents sent me to live with. Bar is in hell. Bar is with Hades. Bar is so deep through the center of this earth that we've tunneled all the way through and into the sun. It just never feels wrong. That's all I know. I, did you finish those college applications yet? <laughs> Hello and welcome to my latest mental breakdown, otherwise known as Credence by Penelope Douglas. This absolute treat of a romance novel is a 500 page slow burn reverse harem between a girl, her step uncle, and her two step cousins in which she catches feelings for and then smashes all three of them. Yep, all three of them. Yes, I knew this was the premise going in before I read this. Sometimes I make decisions in life that I shouldn't be making just because I'm feeling a little bit goofy. And for the record, I also thought that I was ready for this, okay? Like, I've been in the trenches. I was an internet user with little to no parental supervision, young enough for that to have probably had a real deleterious impact on my brain. I have seen some things, okay? And with this, I thought, it's publicly accessible. It's sold at Barnes & Noble. Like, it's relatively mainstream on social media. How bad could it possibly be? Surely not that bad. Ah ha ha. Yeah, Credence has nearly 250,000 ratings on Goodreads. To put that into a Stephen King context, that's more ratings than his most recent 2022 release, and almost as many ratings as his very well-received memoir on writing. And this book is also self-published, so it's not benefiting from any major publisher marketing. In this video, I'm going to be telling you everything that you need to know about this book. I'm going to be reading some quotes, I'm going to be making some jokes, I'm going to be giving you a full recap, and blessing you with a fresh understanding of just all of the baloney that goes on in this world. Obviously, there are going to be spoilers. If you don't want your stepfamily smut spoiled for you, like, why are you here. What was your plan when you clicked on this video? Okay, two disclaimers before I start. Number one, I know that this book is a weird taboo smug thing, not intended to be taken completely seriously. I am aware of that. I know that there were no actual people harmed in the making of this book. I know that you can like things in fiction that you don't like in real life. I've also heard all of the discourse among the Credence defenders, and I get it. The main character is technically not related to any of them. She's technically 18 before anything truly unhinged happens. I don't know about that one, by the way, but you know what? We'll come back to it. And I also understand that she technically kind of sort of gaslights herself into thinking that she consented to even the most problematic and questionable parts of this book. And to all of that, I say, yes, these things are technically true and practically irrelevant to the sheer amount of misery that I felt in the depths of my soul when I was reading this book. And disclaimer number two, if you like this book for some reason, I'm not here to belittle you personally as an individual. Just avert your eyes, okay? Keep it to yourself. It's none of my business what you enjoy in the privacy of your own home. If you think this video is going to upset you, I recommend simply clicking away. And I'm also not here to belittle this author. Like, clearly they're making boatloads of money on this, considering the fact that it has, again, over 250,000 Goodreads ratings and it's self-published. I imagine the take home on that is pretty insane and I truly doubt that they care about my silly little video. Don't get me wrong, I still don't know why you would ever write something like this. Like, I don't get it, I don't understand, but you know what? It's not for me to know. It exists and it's here and I read it and it's giving us a lot to talk about today. So let's get into it. Before I tell you about all of the super cool and fun events that happened in the book, I feel like I wanna introduce you to some of the major players in the story. First off, we have Tiernan de Haas. Tiernan's our protagonist. Most, but not all of the chapters are going to be from her point of view. It's pretty obvious when they're not, I'll just mention it. And Tiernan is 17 at the beginning of this book. 17, 17 years old. That's a fact I didn't know going into this story. And she turns 18 during the book. Aren't you excited to see how that comes into play? I'm sure you are. In terms of character traits, some key words are that Tiernan is depressed, repressed, and she also has the personality of a dish rag. But it's all because of trauma, so it's fine, or so they say. Next up, we have Uncle Jake, who is the bachelor of the mountain mansion where this entire step family lives. More on that later. In terms of vibes, if this were a young adult novel, he would be the brooding, sarcastic, I hate everybody but you male lead. But it's not a young adult fantasy novel, so instead, he's her uncle and her legal guardian and also old. Truly the only explanation for anything that Uncle Jake does or says in this book is that his frontal lobe must have atrophied into a fine dust prior to the beginning of the story. This man has two children, Noah and Caleb. The mom is not here. I'm sure you can maybe guess where she is based on the stock photo that I chose, but we'll talk about that when we actually get into the book. For now, the kids. Noah Vanderberg, that's their last name, by the way, Vanderberg. He's the younger cousin. He's roughly 20 to 21. And arguably, I would say he's the most normal dude of the three of them. But don't get tricked. He will only grow more and more bizarre as the story goes on. But at least at the beginning, he really does seem to possess a couple of neurons inside of his head as a treat, which really does differentiate him from the other two, so it's worth mentioning. Noah's whole thing is that he wants to leave the mountain mansion and become a pro dirt bike racer out in the world. That's his entire goal. He has a very all-American, kind of mischievous, nice boy vibe, and he's also a complete beta, and that's everything we need to know. Lastly, the older cousin, Caleb Vanderberg, spelled with a K. That just feels important to mention. Caleb is somewhere in the 22 to 23 age range, and he's also nonverbal. Apparently, he hasn't spoken a single 
single word out loud since he was like four, for reasons that you will swiftly discover inside of this book. Caleb's primary personality traits are being evil and violent. The limit to this man's depraved behavior inside of this book just seems to not exist. Whenever I see TikToks out in the world that are like, wow, Caleb eats, I'm like, I would rather starve personally, but you do you. Anyways, those are all the big characters that I feel like you should know about before we start. Obviously, there are a couple of others that I'll just cover as they come up. And also, as you can see, I've compiled a small forest of this book's crimes against humanity, just to catalog a small handful of the ways that I believe this story to be a blight on literature. And we'll be unpacking all of them as they become relevant, but I just want you to know that, like, I could have picked so many things to feature in this forest, okay? This list is not exhaustive. I tried to mostly group things kind of by flavor. I'll leave it at that. And finally, if you have any triggers, any of these triggers that I'm putting up next to me on this screen, I'm gonna be nice, okay? Like, I'm gonna be way less descriptive than this book was when I read it, but like, they're in here, you know? Just, this is a warning. Okay, that's about everything. We're gonna do a break real quick and then we'll get into it. Jumping in with a word from today's sponsor, which is Campfire Technology, a longtime haven for writers that's recently expanded into being a place to read and discover new stories. Campfire started out as a tool that authors could use to help them with world building and with putting together all of the moving parts that are required to bring really complex stories and worlds to life. From character sheets, to templates that help you come up with a magic system, to flowcharts that help imagine how social systems would function in a fantasy world. There are a lot of really neat things that you can do with the tool set that Campfire provides. I've never written a book myself, but you can't read as much as I do without marveling all of the time about how difficult it is to string together a truly phenomenal story. And Campfire is making that a lot easier for a lot of authors. But big news, Campfire has recently become not just a place to write stories, but also a place to read them. And it's still new, it's still fresh, but there are already dozens of novels available. And in addition to offering higher royalties than anywhere else on the market at 80%, which is a great split for authors. There are also built-in ways that readers can explore bonus contents like short stories, additional world lore, character profiles, as you're reading through the books that you discover on the platform. It's just an additional way for you to interact with the author and their world when you choose to support them, which is just really, really neat. So if you're interested in supporting a new platform that puts the connection between you and the author first, I strongly, strongly recommend checking out Campfire through the link in the description of this video and then finding your next read there. And thank you to Campfire for sponsoring this video. I really appreciate it. Back to it. Hi, welcome back. Let's do this. So this book has a playlist in the beginning. No Sweet Home Alabama, which is a choice. There's also a Frederick Douglass quote that opens this book. It is not the light we need, but fire. It is not the gentle shower, but thunder. We need the storm, the whirlwind, the earthquake which is a decision that I find to be peak unintentional comedy. Just imagine teaching yourself how to read, coming up with bars like that, leading the abolitionist movement, and dying a hero, only for your words to be used generations down the line for books like this. I just, it speaks for itself. Our story begins with Tiernan feeling sad about her childhood as she looks outside of her bedroom window at a tire swing that is shifting in the breeze. Basically, both of her parents were super famous. Her dad was a famous director and her mom was a famous actress. And apparently they were so in love with each other that they only had a kid really for the hell of it because it felt like what you do when you really love somebody, but then they realized that actually raising said child would require them to spend time, not just the two of them. So they just ignored her instead. It's kind of like how when your parents are so married, the curve can become a sphere, and then you still end up getting the divorced kid neglect experience anyways. That's what Tiernan's life was like. And the example that we get for this is apparently this tire swing, Tiernan would never use it. She would just watch outside of the window as her dad would push her mom instead of her. And it turns out, just throwing you right into the deep end on like page two, we discover that her parents have recently taken their own lives. And the reason for this apparently was that her dad had cancer, but it wasn't responding very well to treatment. And so her mom was like, I have nothing to live for if you're gone. Definitely not my child. So what if we just both died instead? So that way I would never have to live a day without you, sugar butt. And her dad is like, so true. I see absolutely no repercussions for this whatsoever. So that's what they do. And now they're dead. Tiernan apparently is the one who discovers the bodies the next day. And this is a surprising development for Tiernan because not only was she not aware that this was her parents' plan, she also apparently didn't even know that her dad had cancer at all the entire time that he was going through those treatments. They Ever told her, why would she want to know? And of course they also don't even know when they die because why would they? You know, like they're the cartoonishly awful dead parents. They're clearly the tragic backstory here. That's why we're getting info dumps to on like page two. My mind races, caught between wanting to let it go and wanting to process how everything happens. Mirai is here every day. If I didn't find them, she would have. Why didn't they wait until I'd gone back to school next week? Did they even remember I was in the house? So yeah, this is Tiernan's lore. And as a result of all of this childhood whimsy that she was exposed to growing up, she is not beating the weird kid allegations. Her primary personality trait is being in incredibly poorly socialized. It turns out that her only friend, apparently, is her mother figure slash her actual mother's personal assistant, whose name is Mirai. And we like Mirai, okay? Mirai's nice. Mirai's the person who would buy all of Tiernan's gifts growing up. She would, like, actually talk to her. Really seemed to be the only person in this household who cared whether Tiernan lived or died. So yeah, they're very close. But other than Mirai, it seems that Tiernan has not a single other friend on this entire green earth. It's giving sheltered. It's giving repressed. It's giving a complete lack of experience with unconditional platonic love. All important things when it comes to understanding 
understanding the choices that Tiernan will eventually be making in this book. And the only other thing that happens during this scene that ends up shockingly being relevant later is that Mirai takes down this tire swing that makes Tiernan so sad. But after that, a few days post the death of her parents, Tiernan ends up getting a call on her burner phone that she has for some reason. It's never been used before and it'll never be used again for the entire rest of the story. I think its sole purpose is to make this call a little bit more dramatic. And who's calling her? Who's on the line? That's right, it's Uncle Jake. Welcome to the book. Uncle Jake, happy to have you here. And in this conversation, we learned that apparently Tiernan's dad has left Tiernan to Uncle Jake in his will for some reason. Despite the fact that the two brothers apparently hate each other and have hated each other since before Tiernan was even conceived. So it's like not a decision that makes a massive amount of sense, but you kind of have to accept it or you don't get past page 10 of this book. But Uncle Jake at first is pretty cool about the entire thing. He's like, yeah, you know, like, I don't know you. I've never met you in my life. You're going to be 18 soon. So if you want, you can just emancipate. Like, I'm not going to put up a fight. And Tiernan again has never met this man or his family. She doesn't know anything about him because again, her dad hates him. So he never talked about him. I mean, Tiernan's dad also apparently just never spoke to Tiernan, which would probably also be a part of it. But Uncle Jake, when he's finished with the, you can be free if you want shtick, he starts kind of hitting her with like the e he he unless. I came out here when I wasn't much older than you. I had soft hands and a head full of shit I didn't know what to do with. I was barely alive. There's something to be said for sweat and sun, hard work, solace, and keeping busy. We've built everything we have here. It's a good life. Have you had a good life? And Tiernan is thinking to herself, God, no, my life is trash. Everything sucks. I have nothing to live for in this world. So she's like, you know what? Let's do it. Let's move in with these men I've never met before and know nothing about. What could possibly go wrong? So that's that's exactly what she does. I feel like I'm going to say this again, but like just imagine the alternate universe where she chose therapy instead. Like two roads diverged in yellow wood, I tell you what. Anyways, we also learned one more piece of critical information during this conversation, which is that Uncle Jake and his sons, they all live at this mountain mansion, right? This like beautiful house in Colorado. But Crucially, the mountain mansion gets snowed in for several months out of every year. It's impossible to go down to town. It's impossible for anything from town to go back up to the mountain. And the three of them are entirely self-sufficient. They live off the land and just do their own thing from about November to April of every year. We start this book in like August, maybe sometime in the summer, it feels like. And the approaching winter will loom over the entire story until eventually it will become relevant, as you might imagine later. Some amount of time later, the day has come and Tiernan is apparently at the airport. She has just touched down in Colorado and Uncle Jake has come to pick her up. Tiernan notices instantly how hot Uncle Jake is, haha, -ha, in a platonic family way, of course. And they talk in the car about how Tiernan will be doing online school while she stays with them, because Tiernan is a senior in high school. She is 17. 17 is how old she is. And let's just start off this book strong, because this decision, this choice that Penelope Douglas made to make Tiernan not only 17, but also in high school during almost this entire book, even after she turns 18, is just absolutely off the wall insane. I cannot capture well enough to you how thoroughly I believe this to be a crime against humanity. Credence would already be, like, so different difficult to defend as a book if she were like 25. But just this additional layer of her youth, it's just, it's not it. It's not it. But anyways, online high school will never be relevant in any capacity to the plot. Tiernan will just be randomly mentioned sometimes as like doing or thinking about homework at the dinner table, just as a fun reminder that she's still in high school. And every time it happened, it made me want to throw this book into the ocean. So that's that. Just keep that in mind as we go through the first half of this book. We also learned during the conversation that they have in this car ride about Uncle Jake's business, what he does for work. And apparently he and his sons, they they repair and they customize dirt bikes for a living inside of this gigantic garage that they have at the mountain mansion that they call the shop. And how it seems to work, their business model, is that they take in a ton of orders for the six months of the year when they are not a part of society, just completely inaccessible to the world. And during the winter, they just pound through all of those orders and then ship them off when the snow melts and they can finally go back into the town again during the spring. After which point, they seemingly just take the rest of the year off. I mean, it's kind of unclear, but they definitely don't seem to be doing anything during the summer portions of this book. Economics, you know, it's the way of the world. Other than talking on their way up, Uncle Jake takes Tiernan to a candy store to buy her a little bag of candy, which is just not a great thing to have Uncle Jake do on the first day of knowing Tiernan when you know what kind of book this is and where this goes. It, just, it may, didn't make me feel great, but eventually they get up to the mountain mansion and Tiernan is introduced to Noah, who appears at this point to be an entirely normal person, a facade that will fade as we go throughout this book. And when she's getting a tour from Uncle Uncle Jake of this house where she lives now, there is this whole dead deer that is just hanging right next to the washing machine in the dryer. I don't know, because that's just how they do it up on the mountain. And Tiernan's like, this is pretty crazy. And Uncle Jake just goes, we're self-sufficient. You better not be a vegetarian. <laughs> and it only takes until page 27 for things to start getting properly weird. Family tour is over. Tiernan's been shown to her bedroom and she decides to hit Uncle Jake on the way out with the, you hated my father, didn't you? Won't it be uncomfortable for you to have me here, Uncle Jake? I don't see your father when I look at you. Tiernan. His eyes darken, and I watch as he rubs his thumb across the inside of his hands before he balls it into a fist. And you don't have to call me uncle, he says. I'm not really anyway, right? Ah! 
E he he. The next day, Tunin's first morning waking up into this house, she goes to the bathroom to brush her teeth as one does in the morning and the door opens directly in front of her to reveal a completely random naked woman who we later learn is named Jules. And Tiernan's just staring at her like, who is this person? And the stranger hits her with the The difference between pizza and your opinion is that I asked for pizza. It's like seven in the morning, by the way, I just want to mention that. Observant viewers will have realized that Jules is not on this board and that is because she is completely irrelevant to the plot. What she represents is this thing that all of the men who live in this house do where apparently they are just so sexy. They're just so hot and cool and interesting in comparison to the detritus level men in the small town nearby that untold numbers of women will just climb the mountain in the middle of the night and show up at like four in the morning, let themselves in, and then go upstairs and bang whichever Vanderberg that they came to bang. Actually, no effort is ever expended by any of these men. They don't even need game. They're just like that hot, I guess. So sometimes Tunin will just run into these women as she did this morning, or alternatively, she will hear them through the walls. It's just a new fact of life for her. And also in that vein, it's worth noting in tandem with this that Uncle Jake and his two children, they never wear shirts. Like there's no point. They're just shirtless all of the time. In functionally every indoor scene in this entire book. It's a notable difference when they're described to be clothed. Tiernan's like, wow. And I just, I feel like that's worth remembering as we move through this book together. Anyways, it turns out that Jules, that woman, was Uncle Jake's townie this time, which is crazy. Like imagine adopting a traumatized child, bringing her home, giving her a house tour, and then thinking to yourself, yeah, this is a great time to have a mysterious naked overnight guest that I will not introduce in any capacity to Tiernan, who will just surprise her when she wakes up. What? But it's whatever. And Tiernan's chilling. And after Jules leaves, Uncle Jake and Tiernan together just immediately again. Like we're on chapter three and it's already so cursed. And we get this mini montage between the two of them where they drink coffee together and there's weird sexual tension. They ride a horse together and there's weird sexual tension. He teaches her how to shoot and there's weird sexual tension. Tiernan helps him in the shop and gets a splinter and there's weird sexual tension. But as I glare up at him, the splinter's forgotten and I stop breathing for a moment. Warmth spreads up my neck as his gaze hovers down on mine, hard and angry, but kind of puzzled too. Like he's trying to figure me out. His eyes drop to my mouth and I stop breathing, everything getting warm. A trickle of sweat glides down his neck and the hair on my arm stands on end, aware of his naked chest. We're too close. He finally blinks a few times and then he brings the palm of my hand up to his lips, the warmth of his mouth trying to suck the wood from my hands. My mouth falls open a little as his teeth gnaw and tease the splinter and my skin is sucked and tickled. That's her uncle, by the way, just a really nice guy helping her get the splinter out like that. I'm sure you can see where this is going between the two of them, but shockingly, it'll take like another 200 pages to get there. Anyways, like immediately after this scene, we get the first instance of Uncle Jake reminding Tiernan to protect her virtue. Truly an irony made all the richer by, again, the random stream of women who will just show up to the house at all hours of the day. Stay away from the local guys, you understand? If you get a boyfriend, you won't be able to see him once we're snowed in anyway. Besides, they're not your type. How do you know? Because I'm telling you, they're not your type. I will let you know when one is. Eventually they're done, they go to bed, and we end up getting another dollop of Tiernan lore here because she has her first experience of having a really bad nightmare. Apparently she used to wake up screaming and crying all of the time and the only person who would help was her mother's personal assistant slash Tiernan's mother figure Mirai because once again, evil parents. But for the most part, those night terrors went away as she got older with the exception that they are now making a resurgence for some reason. After this point, we get our first non-Tiernan POV chapter. Once again, this book will have occasional moments from different perspectives and they're always so much worse than the rest of the book. And this chapter is from the perspective of Uncle Jake, who is already just thinking some fun thoughts about that high school senior who is now in his care. I don't need her to stay. It's no skin off my nose if she leaves, but I can forbid her from leaving if I want to, if for no other reason than to burn off my exceeding supply of frustration with her father, to make her work off his debt to me, to f up her life just a little bit, to make her. She wets her pink lips and my breath catches for a moment if I were a worse man. This is a wonderful time to reveal the next crime of this great American novel, which is Uncle Jake's inner world. And this is really a catch all for a lot of fun things that happened during this book. But this man speaks, thinks and acts like somebody scooped out important parts of his brain with a plastic spork. There's just no other explanation for any of it. I want to mention here too, that this book does this thing where Uncle Jake is helping Tiernan to break out of her shell, right? After everything she went through in her childhood, Tiernan's just so sad and boring and repressed. And Uncle Jake will frequently try to pep talk her and like make her feel better and show her that there's more to life than feeling nothing. You know, it's a great big world out there. And it is just impossible to take him seriously ever, ever. When you know that inside of his heart of hearts, he's thinking thoughts like this in this chapter. Dude, you're 45. Why are you thirsting after your 17 year old step niece? Oh, and you're like telling her to love herself. Like you're weird. You're, you're a freak. Go to prison. <sighs> 
Anyways, in his chapter, he also ends up having a phone conversation with Mirai, and she's called him to ask him, like, hey, you know, what if Tiernan came and lived with me instead, considering the fact that you guys don't know her, and I don't know you, and this entire thing sure does seem a little bit weird, which, you know, fair for the only adult who seems to have ever looked after Tiernan's health or safety to be like, these strange men in the mountains seem to be a little bit suspicious. Like, if you ask me, that's fairly reasonable, but Uncle Jake gets really mad, and he's basically like, you think you could raise her better than me? You had your shot. Look how that turned out. Out, which is a wild thing to say on like day three of knowing Tiernan, but you know what? Conversation's over, I guess. She's staying for now. Back to Tiernan's point of view in the next chapter, and she's going into town to go to the pharmacy to fill up her birth control prescription in bulk, just, you know, as prep for the winter, the long winter that she's about to have. She goes with Noah, who still at this point is normal, like they have a pretty normal cousinly trip, I would say, to the pharmacy. I mean, it's made a little bit weird when Noah buys not one, not two, but eight boxes of condoms. Need I remind you about the stream of random women who just come into the house all of the time? You gotta stay prepared, but whatever. The actual dynamic between the two of them is like fine for now. On their way home, Noah just decides to start psychoanalyzing Tiernan out of nowhere. My dad thinks you resent your parents, and that's why you're not sad about them dying. I think you are sad, but not as much as you're angry, because actually it was the other way around, wasn't it? They resented you. Truly an empath, Noah. And he keeps going with this. He monologues for a little bit longer about how Tiernan's parents loved each other more than they loved her, but despite that, she still loves them. This, I believe, is the complex characterization that I've seen praised for this book, and honestly, there's something to it. Like, there's something to the journey that Tiernan goes on in this book. If this book has literally any other destination, if it is any other arc, if there's anything going on inside of here other than what does go on, but of course not. And with this, I want to reveal early on what is probably my second least favorite part of this book, and that is that it attempts to have themes. Credence just really wants to be about something. It would be a lot harder to hate this as much as I do if it was not taking itself so seriously. And we're going to see a lot more of this as we go on in the book. I just wanted to bring it to your attention early. Anyways, after this conversation, Tiernan can't sleep. She's like up for hours in bed thinking about what Noah said during that conversation, thinking about the fact that he read her like a book, much like the book that I unfortunately read for this video. Do you see all of these tabs? That's how well that Tiernan feels like Noah read her. But during this insomnia moment, Tiernan decides to get up and just start wandering around the house. Go exploring, if you will. And it's when she enters the shop during her midnight wanderings that she finally meets Caleb, the last man of the house. For approximately the first 20% or so of this book, we have not seen Caleb on page. And the reason for this is because Caleb does woods, okay? He'll just decide to go trekking for many days, apparently. Sometimes up to a month. And nobody looks for him when he's gone. They just kind of assume that he's going to be okay because he's the best whoever woods in the entire world. He knows everything about woods. There's nothing that the woods can do to him that would hurt him. He was born in woods, okay? He was molded by woods. So yeah, for the first like 100 pages or so, Caleb has just been doing woods. So we haven't met him yet, but we have gotten some quotes leading up to his introduction that have established his presence inside of the book. This is Uncle Jake talking to the cashier at the candy store. Don't worry, Jake laughs, handing the guy cash. We'll protect her from the big bad elements. When have you ever been able to control Caleb? This is from the house tour. Caleb's room is on the third floor. It's the only room up there, so no need for a tour. It's got a great view though. Lots of air and space. He likes space. Keep that in mind when you meet him and don't take anything personally. This is from Jake's POV chapter. I can't do Tiernan any good. I can barely keep my own kids under control. Noah's 10 seconds from packing a bag and leaving any day. And Caleb, Jesus, Caleb. I've never been able to imagine that kid's future because men like him don't live long. He makes too many enemies. And then this is just Noah Quippen during a conversation with Tiernan. I'm a teddy bear, Tiernan. You still haven't met Caleb yet. And at least me reading this, I expected him to be weird. Yeah, because all of the men who are living in this house are bananas. But I thought that he was going to be weird in like an Edward Cullen meets four from Diversion kind of way. A bad boy who doesn't talk because nobody's worth his time and he's kind of an alien kind of way. And this was not the case. I'm just gonna throw in another trigger warning here for good measure because, you know, pretty deplorable stuff to come. Honestly, it's a safe assumption for like the entire rest of this book that if Caleb's on screen, then there's pretty deplorable stuff to come. So buckle in. A man stumbles over the threshold of the shop, wearing jeans and blood running down his bare chest. Nobody wears shirts in this universe from the dead animal carcass hanging around his neck. And Tiernan just watches him for a second as he puts the deer down onto the table and like washes his hands, but not very well because he's messy, he's rugged, he's of the woods. And eventually Tiernan ends up announcing herself and saying hi, just as you do in a situation like this when you're meeting somebody that is in your family and also that you live with. And Caleb turns to look at her, but obviously he says nothing in response because he doesn't talk. He kind of just like stares at her for a little while. What's his problem? Why isn't he answering me? As he turns toward me though and tosses the shop cloth into the sink, he meets my eyes again, holding my stare. And then he cocks his head a little. I almost laugh. The gesture makes him look so innocent, like a curious puppy. <sighs> 
But then his loaded eyes drop to my stomach again, and his chest rises and falls heavier, and I clench my thighs. Instinctively, I put my hands where his eyes are, and I feel it. The bare skin of my stomach. Already weird vibes in the way that this scene was going. I already didn't like it between the two of them, but then, because Caleb is himself, just as a character, as a person, a crime against humanity throughout this book, he seems to mistake her for one of the random women who just comes into the house at three in the morning to smash, and he approaches her, he pushes her up against a car, and you know what? I'm not gonna go into too much detail. I feel like your bountiful imagination can complete this picture pretty accurately, but long story short, he starts kissing her and then almost hits the third base while the entire time Tiernan is like out loud verbally telling him to stop. She is clearly incredibly uncomfortable. She's panicking inside of her internal monologue and saying things like, quote, none of this feels good or warm and none of it makes me feel soft inside like I could kiss him back. It is actually a vile scene and it's also maybe one of the worst character introductions that I have ever seen for somebody who you are clearly supposed to like and root for by the end of this book because once again Tiernan is like out loud begging him to stop until eventually she's able to gather herself enough to like scream and slap him across the face. And Caleb, by the way, has the audacity to look at her like offended and surprised when she does this, which like, where am I? And it's not even known for sure if this would have been enough in a vacuum to actually stop him because at this point, Noah walks in and he's seemingly not really that surprised about what is happening, which is a big enough red flag, but this man looks out into this terrifying scene. And I so wish I was making this up, but he just goes, no, Caleb, you can't do that. She's family, she's not a townie. As if A, Caleb is just like a little puppy dog who stole a table scrap off the kitchen counter. And more importantly, B, it's like chill for Caleb to treat girls from the nearby town like this, but it's just not okay if it's your cousin, which is just an insane concept to me, like how they apparently live up there. And Tiernan, to her brief credit, is pissed in this moment at the both of them. She's like, what is the matter with you? And Noah says, just cut him some slack. He's always starving when he comes back from being in the woods this long. Then eats, and that's when he was doing. Anyways, to make things even worse, because we needed things to be even worse, Tiernan's only mad at Caleb for like a page, because by the end of the chapter, she is genuinely thinking this to herself, and she will keep thinking about the experience through this lens for the entire rest of the book. For several minutes, I'm lost in thought about where that would have gone if Noah hadn't come in, if I hadn't forced myself to push his brother away, and how much of it might not have been Caleb's fault. This is to me the most unforgivable thing that this book will do time and time again. You will just have Tiernan completely gaslighting herself retroactively into thinking that she enjoyed and may as well have consented into the most banana situations that you could possibly imagine. I think if I were less of a masochist, I would have DNF'd this, but like my curiosity just required me to finish it and report back to you. So here we both are and more on this later, we're not done. But just for now, I wanna say, pick a struggle. If you insist on writing a step family reverse harem with a teenage protagonist, already a wild decision for the record. Why are you also throwing in SA that that just gets completely forgiven repeatedly by the narrative? Like, I just, it doesn't make any sense to me. Still 17, by the way, I just want to throw that out there for you to chew on. So Tiernan's immediate response to what just happened between her and Caleb is somehow not to simply leave and move out and never talk to any of these people again. Hence why this book has like 400 more pages. We're just different people, me and Tiernan. And she wakes up the next day at like five in the morning to the dulcet tones of Noah smashing a girl through their shared wall. I roll my eyes and fall back to the bed. They really are living their best life, aren't they? Must be nice to have your bed buddies come to you at the crack of dawn every morning. Anyways, she gets up, she looks in the mirror, she finds blood on the hem of her shirt that had transferred from the deer the night prior, which is a wild image to say the least. And then she runs into Uncle Jake who thinks to himself, yeah, day three at 5.30 a.m., this is the perfect time to ask my Stephanie's who I am legal guardian to if she's a virgin. Back home in LA, do you have a boyfriend? I spit the toothpaste out, but instead of answering, I go back to brushing. Have you had any men? He asks more bluntly when I don't respond. I slow my strokes, my breathing turning shallow. Is he asking if I've had sex? Every inch of my clothing touches my skin and my blood course is hot through my veins. What does he want from me? You're still a girl, he says, guessing the answer without me telling him and you still need some raising. Step uncle, by the way, family, by the way. No worries though, no worries. The two of them go on to have this really fun moment where Tiernan's like, you don't know how to raise girls. And he's like, then watch me make a man out of you. And he pretends to teach her how to shave her face with shaving cream. But then when it's over, they just make this really weird charged eye contact. As I, the reader, sat on what felt like the precipice of insanity. Looks like I failed, he says, barely above a whisper. There's no hiding what you are a girl. He almost sounds remorseful at that fact. I may never be a man, I tell him, but I won't always be a girl either. I pause long enough to see him falter and his face fall, and I can't help the small smile that peeks out as I turn and leave the bathroom. Surely I can take on more responsibilities when I'm a woman. 
Tiernan goes on to make everyone pancakes for breakfast and they all eat together and the vibes are off as you would expect after recent events. And finally, at this point, Tiernan is properly entering the delusionally horny for everybody around her state in which she will exist for the rest of this book. I drift my gaze around the table, noticing I have more clothes on than any of them. Jake and Caleb aren't wearing any shirts and Noah's T has the sides cut out, giving glimpses of the smooth, tan chest underneath. Caleb's black hair against his sun-kissed face, Jake's toned shoulders and narrow waist, the veins in Noah's forearm, and I straighten, swallow, and turn around, quickly leaving the room. I need to get out of here. Genuinely, the length of this book, if Tiernan leaves, if she absconds, if she calls Mirai and tells her about even one of the things that have been happening inside of this environment that she has found herself in over these last hundred pages. This book, over. My dignity, preserved. My faith in humanity and in the world as a wonderful and happy place. It's still blemished, it's still a little bit hurt, but it's not completely irreparable. But instead, on we will go. Tiernan volunteers to help Jake haul some hay into their barn because they're homesteaders, they gotta look after the homestead. And who's in the barn when Tiernan walks in? It's Kayla and also a random woman who we will later learn is named Cece who is actively in the process of let's just say having some fun and Cece's all like babe I want to hear you I want to make you react to me like do you like this and Caleb's not saying anything obviously because he's a silent sociopath and he ends up spotting Tiernan in the barn and just holding eye contact with her and yeah they just stare at each other like all the way through the end until for some reason Tiernan is the one who like audibly moans just watching this immediately after this barn moment everybody is going into town to just ride some dirt bikes around as they do. And Noah's like, Tiernan, ride with me on my dirt bike. I'm the best to ever do it, remember? And Jake's like, yeah, come along. But Caleb just looks at her and then looks at the house and nods at the house, dismissing her. A simple act that just incinerates this poor girl's ego. And she ends up going woods for a walk instead. And she finds a pond and she's like, guess I'll go have a swim. And that's what she does. She's having a merry old time all on her own. When suddenly, out of nowhere, appears a guy named Terrence. And Terrence is a townie that Tiernan had met in passing when Noah was buying his eight boxes of condoms at CVS like 20 pages ago. And Tiernan Terrence thinks that Tiernan is really, really hot. And as he's trying to woo her, he says such charming things as, if you go, I don't know if I'll ever be able to get you alone again. They're very protective of their property. I'm not their property. Everything on their property is their property. They live by different rules up here, Tiernan. And also, they always get the prettiest ones too, until now. The prettiest one they'll keep home into themselves, won't they? What if I were to come up here Friday night when you're alone? Would you let me in the house? Yeah, so not the best energy radiating from this man. But again, Tiernan is just like really, really horny all of the time at this point in the story. So despite herself, she's still into this like negative number amount of risk. And the two of them are on like the cusp of making out when suddenly, vroom, vroom, two dirt bikes come shooting out of the woods and stop at the shore of the pond. Noah and Caleb have arrived at the scene. Terrence and Tiernan are kind of just like watching this happen, a little bit surprised. And Noah's just looking at them like, but Caleb has picked up a nearby shotgun and is pointing it directly at Terrence. What are you gonna do with that, Caleb, huh? He grins as Caleb loads a shell. But before Caleb can shoot and murder this man, Noah ends up collecting Tiernan and they drive out of the woods before things start to escalate. Eventually, everybody makes it back to the house and it turns out that Terrence and Caleb got into like a fist fight or something because Caleb just has a bunch of free bleeding wounds now on his face. And Tiernan finds this entire thing to just be really cringe, which I respect her for given the fact that it is. And Uncle Jake is like, go make us dinner because that's Tiernan's chore, but she's mad. So she's like, I'm not hungry, so no. And Uncle Jake is like, we are, so you gotta do it. And Tiernan threatens basically that Uncle Jake should just send her home because she's not following instructions and she's basically just picking a fight at this point. I look at Caleb, unable to stop myself. I don't feel bad for you one bit. You got what you deserved because you used me as an excuse to start a fight. You weren't defending my honor. Like any troglodyte male, you're just dying to hit something. You enjoyed yourself. And they all argue for a little while, but Uncle Jake, because he's just such a cool and balanced and mature legal guardian to this 17 year old girl, he hits her with the no maids here, no butlers, no assistance to wipe your little ass. No easy access to your psychiatrist to get you your pills that you need to dull the pain of how shallow your life is. Is anything your problem? Do you give a shit about anyone but yourself? You don't ask us questions about our lives. You barely eat with us. You won't sit with us. You have no interest in who we are. Because I'm always in the kitchen, I blurt up at him, my chest nearly brushing his. You're a brat he breathes out, seething. A self-absorbed, snobby little brat. And obviously what Uncle Jake says upsets her because she feels reminded of the fact that she's poorly socialized and was just kind of used to talking to nobody ever at all because that was her life prior to this with her cartoonishly evil family. So she gets quiet for a second and then tells them this, but before any of them can respond, she just sprints upstairs to go cry herself to sleep and be miserable, as one does sometimes. But anyways, we get a pretty cute scene after this where again, this really could have been a sweet coming of age story if it wasn't also everything else. Because Tiernan wakes up the 
next morning. And for context, apparently she'd thrown away that bag of candy that Uncle Jake had gotten her on her way up the mountain just because she has this internalized hatred towards processed foods that she got from her cartoonishly evil mother. But now, this morning, that same sack of candy is on her nightstand, again, with a note that says, your parents never gave you anything sweet. That's why you're not. Tiernan goes downstairs to start making herself some coffee before her uncle stops her and has her relax as he finishes it for her. And he hands her this completed coffee really calmly, kind of as a gesture for peace. And she says to him, I'm going to go home. I say quietly, you are home. And then the two of them hug in a way that is shockingly not weird as she's crying finally, like all of those tears that she didn't cry over the death of her parents originally. And Uncle Jake is saying the right things. He's like, you're not alone, Tiernan. Like not anymore, okay? You have a family now, no matter what. And it's sweet, it's tender. And I'm an objective critic, okay? I can see that. And I can also acknowledge the absolute psychic warfare of following that scene directly with this line. My eyes drop to his lips. And for a moment, I'm with him, breathing with him and my blood coursing hot under my skin as I taken his tanned face, smooth mouth, and the rugged scruff along his jaw. I have a sudden urge to wrap my arms around him and hide in his neck, but he runs his thumb over my jaw. The heat under my skin spreads lower, and the small smile he had on his lips fades as he stares down at me. Finally, he blinks, breaking the spell as he drops his hands. Get dressed, okay? Pants and a long sleeve shirt. You're with me this morning. Despicable. Like, you can't keep doing this to me, Penelope. You can't disarm me with actual family bonding, only to remind me that this man belongs in actual prison. I can only take so much okay? I'm only so strong. Tiernan gets dressed and she goes out to work with Uncle Jake and thinking about how he had recently yelled at her for not asking any questions about their lives, she thinks to herself, I need to learn all of the family drama right now in this conversation. So she goes in for the kill and she's like, why doesn't Caleb ever talk? And Uncle Jake is like, oh, that's nothing to do with me. That's his beef to discuss with you. Which is rich considering the fact that famously Caleb does not talk or communicate in any way. So I'm not really sure how Tiernan is expected to get this seemingly extremely important story from Caleb considering he has not spoken to anyone in 20 years. So that's a statement that doesn't make a lot of sense. But Tiernan's like, okay, follow up. Was it his mom? And Uncle Jake is like, oh, her? Yeah, she's in prison. The woman is in jail, quote, 10 to 15 up in Quintana. And Tiernan, in response to this, is like, do you love her? Immediately thinking to herself, what a dumb question, because like, that's his wife. Or maybe they were divorced. I mean, it's never really explained. Like, it's possible that they were never married at all. But whatever, instead of being like, yeah, or no, but I used to, this man is like, no, I dove into her because I couldn't stop loving someone else. My first love, Flora. And on the spot, he whips out this Polaroid picture of Flora that was taken, mind you, before Tiernan was even conceived and has just been in his pocket ever since. Flora's lore is that she was the daughter of immigrants, which Uncle Jake's family, for the record, were very old money, pasty white rich people. So they did not approve of this union that happened between the two of them. But against the wishes of his parents, Uncle Jake kept seeing Flora anyways, just because they were so in love. All the way up until apparently like three generations of this man's family conspired to hash a dastardly plan that put Tiernan's cartoonishly evil parents at the center of everything. Your mother was a rising star and your parents had just started dating. She took Flora out and got her drunk. And when Flora woke up, she was in bed with another man. Another man who wasn't me. <gasps> My father. I say, putting the pieces together. After this, Tiernan's parents conspire with her grandparents to blackmail Flora into dumping Uncle Jake. Because if she doesn't, then they're all gonna tell him about what happened, which for the record did not even occur. It was all staged. And also they just give her $50,000 on the spot to move away, which she does, like she's down for at this point. She's very traumatized. So she leaves, she starts a new life. And eventually Uncle Jake is able to hunt her down after she disappeared so mysteriously. And he knocks on her door and Flora turns him away. She doubles down. She says to never talk to her ever again. And Uncle Jake for the record still does not know what happened between his grandparents, his brother, and Flora. So he just feels rejected and leaves. And he only finds out that it was his own family blackmailing Flora when he gets a call from her sister a week after he visits her, because it turns out that Flora has taken her own life, like just like that. Never even one time did she talk to him in any way or even allude to the fact that there was anything suspicious going on. It just is what it is. It's unfortunate for both of them to say the least. But yeah, Uncle Jake is obviously pretty mad about this entire thing. That's why he hates Tiernan's dad and also his entire family. And he moves to the mountain mansion specifically to start a new life because he was so sad. And the mother of his children, by the way, is just a complete footnote. Who cares? We never learn how they met. We don't even learn her name until like the second to last page of this book because Flora is his lost love. Okay. And to prove it, he has this gigantic tattoo on his ribcage that Tiernan thinks about here. I drop my eyes to Jake's waist. The tattoo he sports on the side covered by his t-shirt now. My Mexico. He said Flora was an immigrant. So is the tattoo for her? Weird option. Or how cowboys escaped across the border back in the day. Colorado became his escape. His Mexico. Vaguely racist option. The two of them finish their chores together as they do until they spot Caleb who is shirtless again, because of course. And Caleb is apparently just chopping some firewood despite the presence of multiple still open 
open and free bleeding wounds on his face from the afternoon before when he got into that fight with Terrence. Like they're still going strong about 24 hours later. And Jake's like, maybe you should give him first aid. So that's what Tiernan does. It's not a cute wound healing scene and I don't want you to think it was. It's still a rancid vibe. Caleb just loves looking at this woman. Like he wants to wear her skin and it does not get any better here. Next, we dive into a rare Noah perspective chapter and Noah at the front of this chapter is actively smashing a girl. Once again, at like six in the morning because that's just how they roll up in the mountain. But this is not just any girl, okay? This is his ex-girlfriend's little sister. <laughs> and she's like begging Noah to tell her that she's better than her older sister, which is a lot. And Noah also just clearly finds her to be pretty annoying. He's actively dissociating this entire scene and he ends up not leaving this experience completely satisfied if you catch my drift. If I can't come even once, that's unacceptable. I'm good in bed. God. Women leave my room happy. Not like the boulevard of broken dreams that's my father's bed when they realize he only wants sex and not a relationship. Or skid row upstairs in Caleb's room where women are lucky to leave alive. I don't even know how to unpack what I just read to you. There, there's just so much wrong there and Tiernan is about to go on like a PGA world tour. Woohoo! Anyway, speak of the devil, Noah at this point is brushing his teeth and in comes Tiernan to the bathroom and as they're having this argument about who can shower first, they end up having this like tickle fight and Noah thinks about how this is just like having a little sister. I can't wait to get her to the lake. I'm not sure I've ever played with a woman. I wasn't worried about Cool. Very cool. See women as people. 2024 challenge. Difficulty level impossible. Anyways, it's not weird yet between the two of them. And so obviously it still ends up being weird because you can just smell what's going to come to pass in this book from like a mile away. So everything that leads up to it, no matter how platonic it seems, it just ends up having a very cursed vibe. But as they're tickling each other, this woman that Noah just smashed like appears in the doorway and just kind of starts staring at them, confused. And Noah just runs to the door and slams it before turning to Tiernan and being like, just act natural. Just stay quiet and she'll leave because she'll forget that we're here because we're so stealthy, which is just so much. Also this entire time, Uncle Jake is actively yelling like, Noah, go downstairs. You can go to your labor on the homestead for the day, which really adds an additional layer here because Noah truly seems to believe that if they just stay silent, they will become invisible. Truly a level of delusional avoidance that we all strive to accomplish in life. They end up having kind of a wholesome conversation while they're hiding. You ever feel like you're in a box and all you can see are your four walls. No matter what you do, no matter how far you walk, the view never changes. You can't ask me what to do to be happy. I came to Colorado. Did it work? I ask, tugging her braid gently when she stays quiet. Cuz. She jerks her head away, throwing me a scowl. But I see the smile peek out. I like my view a little better. Yeah. I was prepared for smut, okay? I was prepared for a lot. I was not prepared for this book to continue to try to be a real story of growth. They keep talking and again, this entire time there's a woman outside the door who is like, Noah, I'm still here. Please talk to me. Like, it's kind of weird that you're just hiding in a bathroom with your cousin. And Uncle Jake is still yelling at them. But Tiernan is like, you know what? Now is the perfect time to tell Noah about that one time that I almost attempted suicide at 14. Really a choice she is making. And then finally the time has come for them to part ways. But not before we finally get to the point where if you were tricked into thinking that Noah was like mostly normal, especially in comparison to everybody else for a second, for the first 150 pages, <laughs> I shove the shower head toward the wall so I'm clear of the water and grab a towel off the rack, wrapping it around my waist. Approaching, I stand just behind her, enjoying her nervousness. She's barely breathing. And then a thought of what else a young woman might need occurs to me and my smile falls. How does she feel when she gets carried away? I take her braid, rubbing the hair between my fingers as I lick my suddenly dry lips. Oh, you thought for a second that this was just like a cute little coming of age story? No, it's so much worse than that. Without thinking, I twist the lock again and look over at her through the curtain. I can almost see her sticking to her body. Remember the toned calves and thighs. What if she likes me? What if it's just once? a secret. Something my father never has to know. Maybe not today, but maybe tomorrow or next week. In here, in the shower, where no one has to see. But I shake my head and unlock the door, leaving quickly. Jesus Christ, that's not what she needs. The poor kid just lost her parents. Some advice. If there's ever two wolves living inside of you and they're these two wolves, one of them being, let's be sweet to my traumatized step cousin, and the other one being, what if we just smashed in the shower, ee hee hee, as a secret. One of those wolves deserves to be shot. Okay, why are you letting them duel as equals? Look in the mirror, go to therapy. There are just so many solutions to this other than exactly what will happen in this book. I also just wanna reveal here another crime, which is that Noah will just continuously say the darndest things. Obviously this one was not spoken out loud. It was more of a thought, but I really do feel like this example gets the vibe across of what I mean. Just look out for more of those as we go on. The further we get in this book, the more that Tiernan just starts to embody chaos in her words and her deeds. Back to her perspective, and they're having a lake day and Uncle Jake is teaching her how to fish 
fish when they have this interaction. If you don't like fishing, he says behind me, his voice low and husky, there's a pretty cool cave behind the waterfall. It doesn't go that deep, but it's peaceful. Sounds like a good place for teenagers to do bad things, I joke. As a matter of fact, he chuckles, if a guy takes you there, now you'll know what he's after. And then she hits him with the, then maybe you should take me. Which whoa. And Tunin acknowledges that this was a crazy thing to say, so she just like rolls it back, she kind of tries to play it off as a joke, but they just have a really weird remaining time fishing. Uncle Jake trauma dumps a little bit more about things that we already know about, Tiernan just keeps staring at his hands, his rough hands, and it's looking at those big rough hands that she starts to get turned on again, and so she just gets up and like scampers away into this cave. Yeah, the one that Uncle Jake told her about, she just runs straight into it, and because once again Tiernan is just embodying chaos at this point in the book, she sinks into this lagoon and she just starts having a little bit of fun with herself, if you will, as she thinks about what it would have been like to go to the cave with Uncle Jake. And this goes on until she is rudely interrupted by a woman who is wounded. She's bleeding and she's running through the cave. And this woman is Cece and she's being trailed by Caleb. And my first thought was it was him who injured her, but to his credit, we actually later find out that this was not the case. It is maybe the only time in this entire book when a violent event was not his fault. And that's just why it feels notable to mention here. Anyways, sometime later, the entire family is going to this dirt bike race, lest you forget that Noah is the best to ever do it. And we also learn here that Terrence, don't forget about him, he's competing in this race because he is also something of a dirt biker, something of a rising star in the dirt bike community. But obviously Noah wins because he's a talent the likes of which the dirt bike community has never seen before. So to celebrate, they all go to this bar. Cece from the cave, like mere hours ago, she approaches Tiernan and she's like, hey, let's dance. And that is what they do. They both go onto the dance floor and just like grind on each other in the middle of the crowd until everybody is apparently looking at them. And Cece knows that it was Tiernan who saw her in the cave. So at this point she like whispers in Tiernan's ear and she's like, I see right through you. Okay, like you are there because you want to smash Caleb, you absolute maniac. And Tunin, God bless her, for some reason chooses radical honesty here, and she's like, no, actually, I was in the cave because I wanted to jump into the lagoon. So hop off. And Cece has nothing to say to this, like the woman's too stunned to speak. Anyways, shocked it took this long, honestly, but at this point, Uncle Jake and Caleb, they like roll in to break it up between Tunin and Cece because Tunin can't be seen dancing like that. She's a woman of great virtue. She's an honorary Vanderberg. And they all leave from this bar and start driving home. For the record, with other women from the bar that they're taking home, because they're Vanderbergs and that's what they do on the mountain. And Tiernan acknowledges this double standard that is literally in the car with them. And in response to her highlighting how upset she is about this situation, Uncle Jake threatens to spank her. And she's like, whoa, that's insane. And he's like, no, it's called correction. It's cause I care. Which leave her alone. You've known this girl for like five days. But Tiernan continues to fall to chaos as this conversation evolves. You guys get to be with women. Why can't I enjoy someone's company? We can be with women because no one has laid claim to us. No one has laid claim to me. You're a young woman in my house. We claim you until you're old enough. On my birthday, he cocks a dark eyebrow at me, but doesn't reply as he focuses back on the road. Your logic is flawed, you know? If a woman claims you, then she'll also do for you what other women do. But if you all are claiming me, you're not doing for me what other men would do. Dad, I want to go get a criminal boyfriend. Tiernan, we have criminal boyfriends at home. The criminal boyfriends at home. Later that night, Tiernan wakes up screaming from a nightmare once again to the sound of Noah banging somebody through their shared wall, as is tradition at this point. And it's really early, but it's like basically the next day. So she goes downstairs to make herself breakfast in her underwear in a tank top. But she's like, surely nobody will be down here so early. It really should be fine. Yep, someone is. Someone's down there. And it's, it's Uncle Jake. And he's just sitting in the corner of the kitchen, kind of white knuckling a beer. And he's staring at her, obviously. So she She's like, cool, this is, this is cool. Tiernan makes some eggs. She's like cooking eggs during this scene. And as she's finishing up, Uncle Jake just walks straight up right behind her and he whispers into her ear, why did you run from me at the lake today? And Tiernan does not know what to say. So he asks again and she continues to say nothing. And so he goes, I don't think this is a good idea after all. We're not good influences on a girl. I'm not a girl. Have you ever had a man in your bed? He asks in a ragged voice. Slowly, I shake my head. Have you ever been kissed? I nod. On places other than your mouth? Heat pulls between my legs. No, Uncle Jake. Uncle Jake just continues to like breathe on her for a little bit. He grabs her hand and like apologizes for the stream of random women in the house all the time. He's like, we gotta get it out of our system before the winter when you can't leave because it's the winter and none of us can leave and therefore no one can come here and no one can leave because it's the winter. You do know you can't leave, right? Like during the winter when you're here all winter and you're stuck up with us in this house all winter and none of us can leave. And with this, he has the briefest moment of clarity where he's like, you know what? Actually, maybe you should leave prior to winter. And Tiernan's like, 
my dad left me you because it was the best thing he could do for us. As if, for the record, her dad did not hate both her and his brother. As if he didn't make this decision to cause the maximum possible amount of misery to two people who obviously annoyed him. But regardless, when Tiernan says that, Uncle Jake completely unhinges himself from common decency and or any amount of self-control. I gasp as he wraps his arms around my body and forces my face around to look up at him. Do you feel this? He growls over my lips as he pushes me into the sink. The thick, hard as nudges my ankles and I groan. This is what you're doing to me, Tiernan. It's not right. Instead of pile driving the hot t I came home with, I'm sitting down here trying to talk myself out of going into your room and giving the teenage piece of a living in my house a really long kiss goodnight. And do I take my pants off for that? Yeah, this feels borderline illegal to read on YouTube. The amount of censorship that this video is going to have, I mean, you already know because like you've been watching it, but like I am going to be redacting this garbage like it's 1984. 17, by the way, legal guardian, by the way, just want to remind you because why is this book viral? This girl is still in high school. She's still drawing anime eyes in her planner instead of paying attention in math. And you're telling me that these grown men are like, yes, this is worth imploding our entire family structure over. But I mean, like maybe we should hold it together until she turns 18. It's just, it's psychotic. Anyways, they make out and Tiernan is like begging this man for more when he has yet another rare moment of sanity and clarity. No, we can't. This isn't happening. He growls. I'm your uncle. And Tiernan responds with, you were never my uncle. You're a no relation stranger my parents sent me to live with. Genuinely a line straight out of hell. Defenders of this book on TikTok, you're not getting past me with that one. You're my responsibility, he tells me. But it felt good. It felt good tonight, but it'll feel like shit in the morning. To placate her in this situation, Uncle Jake just starts psychoanalyzing her behavior and being like, you are fundamentally empty inside. I'm just a bad decision that you want to make because your parents have hollowed you out completely. And if you don't fix this, if you keep up this life, you're just going to end up miserable forever. You're going to look in the mirror at the 17 year old girl in a 50 year old body and realize you wasted so much time being devastated at how those f didn't love you that you forgot there's an entire world of people who will. Which again is like a disarmingly good sentiment coming out of the same chapter as her step uncle making out with her. You just can't trick me into thinking that this is a positive representation of overcoming hardship. Like, I, I will not be fooled. After this conversation, Tiernan cries a little bit. She goes to bed. There's no smut, thank God. And we get a time skip into this really weird family team building montage where it's like Tiernan riding a horse again with Uncle Jake. Tiernan in the drive-thru buying cheeseburgers with the boys. Tiernan practicing her karate skills after they all watch a silly reality TV show. You know, it's just normal, fun family stuff. But then after that, Tiernan's like, also guys, I'm bouncing to go to the funeral, which for the record is also happening like many weeks seemingly after her parents deaths but she's like yeah i might be gone forever maybe not i mean nobody really knows for sure but i am going to be leaving now and th then she just goes time skip to when tiernan's at the funeral she's feeling sad for a little while again because her parents didn't love her we get a little bit of sweet lore between her and mirai who again is like the best personal assistant she takes the role to another level because apparently every night when tiernan was growing up with night terrors it was mirai who would crawl into bed and cuddle up next to tiernan to make sure that she would feel comfortable and safe and the nightmares would stop and she would do this until tiernan was old enough for the terrors to go away. You know, just actual parental love for a child that isn't tainted by being a criminal. Yeah. Um, the funeral passes. Again, Tiernan is pretty sad the entire time, but like she's also having her critical realization moment, which tragically is that she wants to be at home with, with the Vanderbergs. That's her home now. That's that's the realization that she has. She wants to be with them instead of with maternal icon, best to ever do it, Mirai. So back she goes. We get her return in a Noah perspective chapter. Apparently everybody was miserable when she was gone. Uncle Jake has been acting his age as a crotchety old man. Caleb is doing some more woods again instead of living among fellow human beings. And Noah is thinking about how he'd rather be dirt biking than living with these losers for another winter. It's just, it's been a bad time for everybody. But then Tiernan just appears and comes downstairs as they're all moping. And she starts like ordering them around to go do some chores on the homestead. You know, like feed the horses while I make some breakfast to represent the fact that she's chosen her home at this mountain mansion. This is the life she wants, okay? Time skip another few weeks. And at long last, it is finally Tiernan's 18th birthday. Woo! As you can imagine, the mountain men have been waiting for this moment with bated breath. And all three of them have gotten her gifts. Noah gets her a t-shirt rep in the family business and a hat with wild written on it, which is a choice. Uncle Jake gets her a hot pink compound bow so that she can go bow hunting, but like make it Barbie slay. And Caleb gives her a painstakingly hand carved leather belt with like mountains and lakes and a dream catcher and stuff on it. And it's really sweet. It's really cute. The book is just begging you to forget about his character introduction and to start to see him as just this, you know, sweet, shy, misunderstood guy. Then I notice something else and I chuckle. The notches go all the way to the buckle. I'm flattered, but my waist isn't that small. Noah leans in, whispering, but your wrists are. 
to celebrate Tiernan's birthday, they all go to a bar and they're hanging out. All three of them are making really ominous references to how winter is fast approaching. And at some point, eventually, Tiernan just loses herself to the music and she starts dancing with these women who are doing a bachelorette party and she gets separated a little bit from all of the mountain men. And out of nowhere, she opens her eyes to find herself surrounded by evil Terrans and his posse of despicable biker bros. This woman is besought on all sides and also short, so there's just really nowhere to escape for her. Cece also appears and she starts taunting Tiernan about how as soon as the snow falls and Tiernan's trapped on the mountain, Caleb's just gonna start beating her up. And in her inner monologue, Tiernan's like, Caleb, Caleb's not like that. Like, he got me a belt. <laughs> Which, again, we do find out eventually that Cece is lying, that Caleb hit her, but Tiernan has no reason to believe that Caleb is anything other than a sociopath. Like, I'm sorry, if you can be bought with a belt after everything else that you have witnessed and partaken in yourself, I just... Anyways, Cece and Terrans and his posse keep taunting her and just really saying some vile stuff, just dropping some more ominous winter is coming messages as well. And Tiernan has started to cry when suddenly in sweeps Caleb from the crowd. And Caleb, like, wipes away both of her solitary tears. He gives her a forehead kiss and then he turns around, he picks up Terrence and he just throws this man into the jukebox. And Tiernan sprints to go and start the car as Uncle Jake sweeps in to make sure that Caleb does not make the terrible mistake of starting this fight. And they all run out and they pile into the car. It's very dramatic. Caleb ended up being the one who's driving this car for some reason. And because he's concerned that evil Terrence and his posse of despicable biker bros will follow them home, Caleb makes the peak game time decision of just running over all of their bikes on their way out of the bar. And they start zooming up the mountain. At this point, the cops are chasing them as are a couple of random bikes that presumably were not totaled when Caleb just decided to deface all of that private property. But just like that, with perfect timing, it has started to snow. And there's ice now that has miraculously appeared on the road. And Tiernan is just watching outside the back window of this car as these lights blink out one by one, as if they're all just crashing and sliding down the mountain as they ascend. And even though at this point, the cops have either given up or fallen off the mountain and died, there are still a few more bikes left and they're actually starting to gain on them. So Caleb, free as a bird, just spins the car into a ditch and starts speeding through the forest instead. No road, no path, just vibes in a blind confidence in his knowledge of woods. This man is just Lightning McQueen speeding through the woods, not hitting any trees. It's nighttime. He just knows exactly where to go somehow. The bikes don't follow them, of course, because that is an insane thing to do, even if you don't have your entire family in your car. But apparently, no one knows woods like Caleb, because he manages to get them back up to the mountain mansion completely in one piece, presumably not even a single scratch on the truck, other than all of the scratches from when they drove over all of those bikes. So yeah, they get home, it's all good, and everybody just starts laughing when Tiernan asks whether the cops will come to arrest Caleb, you know, for either the bikes or the assault. I feel like you can really have your pick. I look at Caleb, who's as cool as a cucumber, moving into the kitchen and whipping off his shirt like he's getting ready for bed or some shit. Noah's laughter dies down, and he rises, coming to stand next to me. The snow won't stop, he tells me. I meet his eyes as he pats my arm, until April. <laughs> And just like that, we've made it to the part of the book where Tiernan, freshly 18, is locked up on this mountain for six months with all of these strange men. Aren't you just so excited to see what happens? Aren't you just thrilled to see how this one goes? Tiernan sure is. At this point in time, I would like to highlight the fact that although Tiernan being 17 and in high school is no longer true, the rest of this book occurs when Tiernan is 18 and still in high school. To me, this is really not better considering the fact that we start out here. But regardless, after everybody gets back from this high-speed car chase, Tiernan has gone up to her room to look out on her balcony at all of the fresh snow on the mountain. It's so beautiful. And for some reason, I'm in heaven, despite Noah's griping about there being no civilization for the next six months. I have all I need right here. And just for fun, because she's hanging out alone in her room, she ends up taking out that belt that Caleb gave her earlier that day. Remember that? I sure do. And she's looking at it, thinking to herself, wow, what a nice man. He spent so much time on this. All the while, almost absentmindedly wrapping the belt around one of her wrists, just for fun, just as you do in the mirror. The belt fits like a cuff on my wrist, the slack hanging, and I stop breathing, the image of Caleb grabbing it and tying it to his bed above some girl's head flashing in my mind. He yanks the strap, her body jerking, and I whimper, Jesus. I shake my head and take it off, tossing it back on the bed. I'm not old enough for that. And I have two wrists. He only gave me one belt. Nice little scare you tried to give me, Noah. Mathematics by Tiernan. Anyways, she goes downstairs to get some more wood for the fireplace in her room to get her through the night. And when she's grabbing it, she turns around and notices that Caleb is just sitting in the chair directly behind her holding a shotgun. And she tries to ask him what's going on. She's like, you can acknowledge me and or write to me and or communicate to me in any capacity to prove that you are in fact a human being. And of course, Caleb does nothing. It's kind of his thing. And this moment's interrupted when 
Noah walks in, also with a shotgun, because why not? And it turns out that the two of them have decided to defend the house until enough snow has fallen on the ground to make it truly impossible for the townies to take revenge by breaking in and kidnapping Tiernan. Tiernan decides to just hang out with them as they do this, and Noah's like, wanna watch a movie? So they put on this random action movie before having like a truly baffling conversation where Tiernan's like, you guys might not have your women who just break in at three in the morning to smash anymore, but like, surely there are other men in other cabins on this mountain that you can just trek to. I mean, you can't be the only people up here, right? There have to be other mountain men. Excuse me? More warm bodies, I clarify, maintaining a straight face. There have to be more guys holed up in cabins up here, right? It's okay. It happens in prison. Gay for the stay. In response, Noah drops the gun on the couch and just tackles her and starts poking at her inner thigh, you know, as cousins do. And they're joking around, they're bantering, until suddenly darkness falls over Noah's face. Things get serious. And he looks at Tiernan and he's like, you want to see how we really get through the winter up here? And Tiernan's like, sure, why not? What's the worst that could happen? So Noah dramatically hoists Tiernan into his lap. He grabs the remote and starts tensely scrolling the TV guide. And he ends up pulling up an adult film, if you will. Now begins the part of the video where, you know, I'm going to give you some facts, but I also don't want this video taken down. So we're going to be tastefully vague. We're going to redact a little bit. And I just want you to assume that whatever I'm describing is on page worse than you could possibly imagine. Okay? Okay. So we get the entire plot of this film in tandem with the rest of what is happening in this scene. It's like some teenagers who are making out in a car and then some cops come and are like, hey man, not cool to be in these woods. It seems like you're loitering. It seems like you're being a public nuisance. But you know what? It's all right. We won't arrest you so long as your girlfriend. Y yeah, you know, they do. They all do. The two cops and the boy, just one after another. Does that remind you of anything yet? Because that be ringing a bell. Also, side note, it's just really not cooking up the confidence that I want for this book to have more teenagers inside of this film subplot. Anyway, so yeah, they start watching this movie and the entire time Noah is whispering just really weird sh into Tiernan's ear. This is what we do to get through the winter, Tiernan. I glance over at Caleb, his face hidden, but I see his chest and stomach rising and falling with his quickened breathing. It's what you'll do too, Noah adds. And if you're thinking to yourself, yeah, these are some pretty weird extracurricular activities to be doing with your brother on the reg. You're in for a treat with this book. Anyways, Noah has like the briefest flash of clarity in this moment and he pushes Tiernan off of his lap and is like, go to bed Tiernan, this is your last chance. And I just want to say, me personally, I would be hiking down the mountain in the snowstorm. Like I would already be on the plane, but because Tiernan is just absolutely insane and also possibly the most horny person ever to walk planet earth, she's like, no, I'll stay. I want to watch. And Noah, who up until this chapter, like he's had his moments, but sincerely he's been by far the most normal person in the trio. He looks at her and he gives her like a little smirk and out of nowhere this man just whips it out as she watches just again very cool casual cousinly behavior is this not what you do at family gatherings Tiernan joins in under the blanket on her side of the couch because at this point in the book she has feelings for all three of these men can you believe it so this is like a dream come true for her i guess and i guess she just like loses herself in the moment or something because she dissociates into it like entirely and she starts yelling for some reason until eventually she comes to and she realizes that the blanket has completely fallen away and at some point she's hiked up her top and also the movie is now over for how long? Nobody knows, and her cousins are just staring at her. I shoot up, but Noah's there, leaning over me before I have the chance to climb off the couch. Don't stop he whispers. His eyebrows are pinched together, vulnerable, almost like he's in pain. Oh god, the ick. The ick that I felt during this scene is transcendental. It's an ick that has never been felt before and would only be surpassed by later scenes in this very book. You're wondering why I finished this? I finished it for you, okay? I took one for the team so that way you would never have to experience what lurks inside of these pages. Anyways, at this point, Noah and Tiernan have started making out. That line gets crossed, by the way, and this whole time, Caleb has just been lurking in the corner until eventually he approaches and, like, holds down one of her wrists as he watches her and Noah, and they say things like, looks like like we might have a little something to play with this winter after all. And this man at one point looks at Caleb and he's like, don't bruise her, at least until she's used to us. Huh? I get your cherry. Noah whispers over my mouth, grinning. As long as I promise not to touch your ass, he'll want that. I felt like I was in the twilight zone reading this scene. Just imagine reading this book and being like, the character development, it's just so good. It's just so realistic. It just hit. Like I, what do you mean? Anyways, so they just keep going and it probably would have gotten even crazier if not for <gasps> Uncle Jake walking into the scene of the crime. What the F are you doing? Jake growls. Noah lifts up and I can see the strain and struggle on his face before his gaze levels and he gives a tight smirk. Nothing she doesn't want. That is just an insane way to react to you and your brother getting caught hooking up with your step cousin by your dad slash her legal guardian on her 18th birthday. Like I just... Anyways, so Uncle Jake ends up banishing the two sons upstairs, but he's like, not you, Tiernan, you stay down here. And she's like, I wanted everything to happen. I have needs just like you. And he's like, you're 17. <laughs> and she's like, I was 17 yesterday, but no longer, not today. And yeah, Uncle Jake reacts to the show of disobedience by giving her some good old fashioned corporal punishment. Come here, he instructs, over my lap, princess. 
and he keeps going until she promises that she won't let Noah or Caleb see her that way again. And then he keeps going after that because they're both just having such a grand old time. And it's a cursed, cursed scene. And then after he's done, he just ends up giving her some forehead kisses and then saying to her, don't make me do this again. In every page I kept reading of this book, I could just feel myself straying further away from God. But you know what? I sure did keep going. The next chapter we get is from Jake's perspective. This isn't my fault. She was lucky I was there. Is that how she wanted to be? for the first time, two at once. They don't love her. <laughs> no shit. Coldest take that anybody has ever said before. That is a sub-zero take. That is a Bose-Einstein condensate level take. Obviously nobody in this house loves her or else none of this would be happening. And Uncle Jake just like desperately wants to take some kind of moral high ground here as if he's not actively on the same page thinking thoughts like, God, she's nice to look at. <laughs> The next morning, they all go hunting together, just like everything is normal and nothing weird at all happened in their house of f horrors the night before. And Tunin doesn't want to shoot the deer, it just kind of makes her uncomfortable, so she's having a pretty hard time. And Noah's like, Dad, bro, like, she doesn't have to do this, like, I can shoot it for her, it doesn't really matter to me. But Uncle Jake is like, no, she's gonna pull her weight. Tiernan, I say. Look at me. The cloudless blue sky and the smell of ice surrounds us. But even now, looking at her innocent face and perfect lips, I feel a light sweat cool my pores. Baby. Look at me. I tell her again softly. She turns her head, her gray pools meeting mine. I wipe a tear from her cheek. If something happens to me or the boys, I need to know you can survive up here. I speak softly, swiping my thumb under her eye to catch another tear before it falls. What we have in the pantry will only last so long. I need to teach you this, okay? I really am thankful for scenes like that, that I can read to you verbatim that just demonstrates to you, I think pretty accurately, how terrible the vibes are at this stage of the book. Like what in the trad, self-sufficient, cousin-smashing nonsense is this scene? I just, Tiernan ends up begging the deer because that pep talk was just so sensational and also because by the way she's like a gun prodigy the best to ever do it apparently and Caleb and Noah go out ahead of them to actually grab the deer and bring it back to the trucks and Uncle Jake and Tiernan are arguing a little bit she's still really upset she apparently ends up punching him like fully in the face and somehow everything leads back to talking about her parents so that's what they do my parents sent me to you because they hated me they wanted me to suffer and you were the worst they could do to me maybe they felt bad about what they took from me so they gave me you I grip the back of her scalp and pull her up to my mouth a payment on their debt that's what you are Tiernan a payment. A payment you'll never collect because you're too old and bitter to spend it right. And I've said it before, but I'll say it again. This man's prefrontal cortex has just eroded into a fine dust. It doesn't exist. He doesn't know the meaning of having inhibitions because instead of thinking to himself, this family member of mine, this niece of mine, this step niece, she's really acting out at a level that's higher than most 18 year olds. Maybe we should have a real heart to heart. Maybe I should like help her. I need to figure out how to make sure that she gets out of this. Okay. Considering how obviously traumatized she is. Those are the bare minimum well-adjusted thoughts that you should be having about what to do with your adopted child. You know, when you're a fully grown adult, when you're 40, like the path should be pretty clear here. I crush her mouth with mine, eating her breath and sucking her lips so hard she whimpers. Anyways, Noah and Caleb walk into this and the two of them break apart like just in time to act natural. And Uncle Jake has a thought that probably feels to him like a light bulb of clarity, but is in reality equally insane in my opinion to what is happening. She should be one of theirs. Why did I soft them the other night? If I had let them go, this wouldn't be happening. Like, how is that the message that he's taking from this situation? They all plan on driving back from this hunting stand and they take in two cars and Noah and Caleb are like, Tiernan, ride with us. We have some celebratory bevs. And she looks at Uncle Jake and she's like, I can go with him if you want. And he just growls at her and is like, no, you should stay. And so Caleb and Noah depart without her, intending to meet her and Uncle Jake at home. And what happens in that car? I'm sure that you can imagine what happens in that car. The vibes during this entire scene are horrible. God, just Uncle Jake's inner world just striking once again. You would never take my inheritance before I was old enough to claim it. It would never occur to you to force me to live here, or she kisses my lips as she looks up into my eyes, or have the balls to stand up to me, a de Haas. I bare my teeth, <laughs> my heart pumping wildly. <laughs> Excuse me? I'm not afraid of you. You won't take anything you want. You're safe, weak. My father said so. I was never worried. She comes in for another peck and I jerk my lips away, glaring at her. He said that, did he? I'm sure you can imagine what he does next. It's not very difficult to guess. I'm sorry, Jake. Oh God, that's Right. I want that piece of to hear his little girl scream my name wherever the he is. I want him to know how much she loves her Uncle Jake. Her Uncle Jake? Go to therapy. <laughs> Something is wrong with you. I would never take your inheritance because your money doesn't interest me. It would never occur to me to force you to live here because I don't have to. You like me. So don't worry. I don't want you to be afraid of me. I hated your slimy parents, but they left me a really pretty piece of who likes it when they lick her. 
Yeah, so anyways, they keep going. She continues to call him Uncle Jake, by the way, just in case you were wondering. And eventually Tiernan's like, no rapper required for this candy. And Jake's like, no, I won't be able to stop. The last woman I smashed with no candy wrapper was my wife 16 years ago. You know, when Tiernan was two. And she's like, it's chill. I'm on birth control. And Jake with no frontal lobe is like, sounds good. So obviously what happens in this car is a crime against humanity for multiple reasons. But I just want to take a moment to acknowledge how much more problematic this is than it ever needed to be. It is not solely that this is her step uncle, okay? Like, whatever, right? You're smut, it's none of my business. This man is her legal guardian. He's responsible for her health and her safety. And he knows how messed up she is. It's abundantly clear how traumatized she was by her childhood. Like, they've had conversations about it. And Tiernan enthusiastically consents in this scene. Yes. But just in no universe should Uncle Jake be seeing her as like a sexual being. Her being in his care and so young and so tortured and just so clearly mentally unwell and not okay. It just, it makes what is already a really cursed image into something that is so much more predatory. Like the facts are a taboo, right? But you can write a taboo that doesn't have this rancid of a vibe. Why couldn't she just be like 25 or something? Like it would still be insane, don't get me wrong, but just having a traumatized teenager smash her uncle the day after her 18th birthday? I'm so sorry, it's just an insane decision to make. And look, it's fiction, it is what it is. Nobody is hurting anybody by reading this book, but it is my goddamn right to shit on this, okay? Like you attempt to have themes, prepare to get deconstructed. I was born with this power and I'm not afraid to use it. And there are just so many more reasons than this, why this book deserves it. But I just wanted to highlight that because obviously there's a different character who is like more obviously evil inside of this book. But I really do think that what Uncle Jake is doing is completely unforgivable. And on that note, the mini rant is over. Let's continue. If this entire thing being a gigantic middle finger to Tiernan's dad was not enough, in the next chapter, Uncle Jake continues the realizations that he should be having in therapy. Her sweet mouth and taste, she feels like like Flora did. Oh yeah, your dead ex-girlfriend that you never got over from before Tiernan was even conceived. Yep, I remember her. Uncle Jake ends up having a like beyond ridiculous conversation with Noah and Caleb after they corner him when he comes back mysteriously late with Tiernan's hair mysteriously mussed up and it's just like really obvious what happens. And father of the year award for Uncle Jake for this one because his response to this, his response to both of his sons coming up and being like, I really like her. I want to do what you do. Just act right. I tell him. She's free to make her own choices. You act right. Jail by the way. Have I mentioned jail in addition to therapy? I should have if I haven't. And with that, despite the fact that Uncle Jake is like, we can never do this again, he was obviously lying and we end up entering the mid-book smut montage between the two of them. Because we didn't have enough going on, they're in the shower and Tiernan has this realization that he's probably thinking about Flora and just has been this entire time, which seems not to bother her, by the way. She's like strangely enlightened about the whole thing. But she asks Uncle Jake, she's like, what did Flora do that you really liked? And he's like, I liked her hands and my hair. And so that's what Tiernan does. And she hits him with the, close your eyes, I pants, to her. Just a scene I could have gone my entire life never knowing about, but now all of you guys know about it too. Anyways, later that night, Caleb goes and visits Tiernan in her room, and she's thinking to herself like, wow, just because I'm smashing his dad, he thinks I'm going to be that easy? Please. But Caleb's not there for that, and this man, just because he's so well-adjusted and normal, not at all a sociopath. He leans over her as she's just like lying in her bed, and he punches the wall directly next to her head, pins her to her bed, rears up and spits on her before reaching over and grabbing a marker from the nightstand and writing the title of a 1989 Taylor version vault track on her forehead. Tiernan has a kind of iconic reaction to this. I'm almost amused. He's had at least three women in his room since I've been here, not counting Cece in the barn that day. But I'm the s who gets spat on? Would I have still been one if I'd let him and Noah share me that night last week? I made a crime for this scene because I think I'm hilarious, but also because this represents Caleb's jealousy problems and just all of the evil things that he does as a result of them. The next morning, everybody in the family is having breakfast together. It is really weird. Noah and Tiernan are like tickling each other's feet under the table while Uncle Jake is like, guys, stop playing around, kind of trying to parent them. And Caleb's still mad, so he just bangs down his dish into the table and knocks over Tiernan's glass of milk into her lap. And they all just stare at each other in silence until Tiernan kind of dunks on him. It's how babies communicate, right? They throw things because they can't use their words. I pick a glob off my face and whip it into my bowl. Did you want more? Is that what you're trying to tell me, Caleb? And Caleb responds to this by flipping over the table and just breaking all of the dishes. So... Yeah, we also get the first of two title mic drops, finally, as Tiernan is reflecting on her new reality for the winter. Something about this house, these people, lend credence every day to what I always knew I needed. Not s not a guy, just a place, somewhere or someone to feel like home. <sighs> She also comes up with this truly unforgettable metaphor. Snowfall isn't like rainfall. Rain is passion. It's a scream. It's my hair sticking to my face as I wrap my arms around him. It's spontaneous and it's loud. Snowfall is like a secret. It's whispers and firelight and searching for his warmth between the sheets at 2 a.m. when the rest of the house is asleep. It's holding him tightly and loving him slowly. Snowfall is smashing my step uncle. Yep, got it. 
<laughs> Dude, the jokes honestly make themselves. I'm just a messenger. Anyways, after these realizations, Tiernan does some chores for a bit, and then she goes into the barn, and she sees Caleb just gutting an animal really violently, which, you know, spooky, so she leaves. But on her way out, she finds a ladder up to this attic in the barn, and in this attic, she discovers a ton of really old furniture, and she ends up deciding that she wants to refurbish it, just as a little bit of an artistic side hustle for her self-actualization of winter. But Tiernan shows Noah the attic, and they end up chatting and having a conversation that turns within a page to, I heard you last night, he says in almost a whisper heard me. His tight lips purse as he tightens the bolt. Daddy didn't love you, so you let mine fuck you so he will. Yeah, so they keep chatting, as cousins do. I was going to to you, you know? My gaze falters. He says it like he's never done it before. I was going to to you. Yeah, so they start to hook up, but Tiernan like feels weird about it, not for the reasons you'd expect, which include, but are not limited to, he's my cousin. I'm smashing his dad twice a day and have been for about a week. He's my cousin, but again. No, Tiernan feels weird about it because she sees Noah as this like soft boy, basically, that she can control and she feels really confident around him. And she doesn't want to complicate that by hooking up with them, which once again, these characters are just not meant for me to understand. So yeah, they stop hooking up, but she was really, really close and she ends up just going back up to her room to smash Uncle Jake again instead. Just, you know, as one does. The next day comes and Tiernan is out in the shop sketching some furniture as she listens to Blue Blood by Laurel just to get those creative juices flowing. But she's having some trouble blending the colored pencils together, like the coloring just looks kind of childish and bad, when suddenly Caleb walks in, last seen viciously gutting an animal and then before that spitting on her. But now he is reformed and he just gently takes a colored pencil out of her hand and teaches her how to color with them because he's an expert apparently. Tiernan ends up telling him about how her cartoonishly evil parents would just throw away all of the art that she had to do for school. And as it tends to go, she starts crying. So Caleb just gives her a big hug and just holds her until she feels better. I want a break to let it go, but he catches me just in time. Suddenly, I feel him, his lips in my hair as he leans over me. I close my eyes and stop breathing as the silent house surrounds us. He holds me, barely touching me. He holds me. Um, yeah, this would maybe be tender if this was a different book entirely with a different character entirely, but instead it just made me feel emotionally manipulated. So anyways, we get a time skip of a couple of weeks and Uncle Jake is leaving apparently to go spend four days at the hunting cabin that they have. Never in this book is it really clear to me why they need to have a hunting cabin since half of the time I get the vibe that they just like walk outside and shoot a deer. I mean, it literally happened that way like three chapters ago, but I guess not. Jake has to go elsewhere, which is very convenient as you might imagine for the plot. Caleb normally goes with considering the fact that his specialty is woods, but for whatever reason, he doesn't go this time. So it's just Uncle Jake and he heads out to the cabin. Tiernan's doing her laundry after Uncle Jake leaves when she realizes that somebody's stolen five pairs of her underwear. And spoilers, we won't find out this entire book where her underwear went or who stole them. But Penelope Douglas has a bonus scene on their website that I read for you because I'm committed to the work that I do on this platform. And you probably guessed it. It was Caleb who stole the underwear. He also stole like one of the Haribos that she uses. Just really cute. Haha. <laughs> that night, Tiernan, Noah, and Caleb have dinner together and Noah looks at her and is like, want to watch another movie? And Tiernan, I shit you not, she responds by saying, nah, sorry, I just have too much homework to do. And she tries to go upstairs when she says that, but Noah stands up and pulls her into him by the collar of her sweater. Noah, stop it, you're drunk. The four empty beer bottles on the table clank as I struggle, kicking the leg of the table. No. I'm bored. He inches up toward my mouth. I want to make to you, Tiernan. I want to f my father's little h Wow. Riz. Anyways, yet again, Tiernan is not against this for the reasons that make sense. She instead hits Noah with like the, you're not serious. You're just gonna go back to smashing random women from town when the road's clear. As if Uncle Jake, by the way, is serious, which is laughable. And Noah, in one of his brief moments of clarity, he goes, you needed affection from him. Noah says, referring to his father. He abused his authority with you. With me, you can play. With me, you can call the shots. E he he. Anyways, I feel like this scene happened because the book needed to justify why what was happening between Tiernan and Uncle Jake is okay, because she ends up just going. Is that what he thinks is happening between his father and me? A little lost orphan who needs love? He really thinks Jake took advantage. When I was 16, this 19 year old guy took me home from a party and wanted to do the same things to me that your father does to me. I didn't let him because I didn't feel anything around him. They both remain silent as I continue. When Senator DeHaven's son cornered me at the governor's ball with a couple of his frat buddies, I go on, promising to treat me right. I didn't want that either. And he got a bloody lip to show for it. And when you all took me out for my birthday and I was dancing and some of the local guys were watching me, I couldn't care less because all I could care about was you and Jake and I throw a look at Caleb and how you were watching me of how I didn't want or need anything from anyone else because I have everything I want in this house. I have everything I want in this house. Everything I want, it's in this house. I'm gonna take a video essay minute here before we continue because the implications of that quote are just so horrible for so many reasons. Like 
where do I even start? Um, first of all, I feel like there's an idea here that Tiernan didn't get essayed because she's just a baddie. As if it was always her choice and she just made the right choices. And Tiernan always having the strength to not succumb to these experiences is like what gives her agency in this moment to talk to Noah and Caleb and to be doing what she's doing with Uncle Jake. But the worst scenes in this book are Tiernan actively not consenting to things. And don't forget, that's also happening. In this entire book, Tiernan just like gaslights herself into thinking that this is actually just her ideal existence. And it's never interrogated. It's only ever enabled by monologues that are exactly like this one that pretends that because Tiernan is just such a baddie she has like an infinite amount of agency and would never do something that she did not enthusiastically consent to and I just I hate it I hate it so much I feel like so many parts of this book are in direct contradiction with each other and what comes out is just a product that feels incredibly slimy it's just icky it's icky okay rant over on with this mind so yeah Tiernan ends up using that monologue as like a see I can make my own decisions and my decision right now is to go upstairs and do my high school homework so that's what she does the next chapter is from Noah's point of view Noah is up really late doing what he does under the covers of his bed when he hears sobbing coming from Tiernan's room. And he stands up to go and check it out, but he ends up running into Caleb, who is like sprinting down the stairs of his attic bedroom into Tiernan's room. He doesn't stop or make eye contact with me, simply opens her door as if this is routine. He enters and I follow, hearing Tiernan scream as he walks quietly around her bed. What's wrong with her? I ask, hanging back by the door, as if he's going to respond, like you were raised with this man. But Caleb just waves a hand, shooing me away as he lies down next to her and pulls her into his body. I watch as she immediately falls in, burying her head in his neck as the cries subside and her breathing starts to calm. He yawns, pulling her sheet and blanket up over them like this is normal. Continuing the bold attempt at a Caleb Redemption arc, do you remember the night terrors that Tiernan had been having as a child and also has been having recently as well? Yeah, so it turns out that Caleb has been going downstairs like every single night, basically, to comfort her. And when I read this book, for one moment, one second, one moment, I was like, this is a cute thing to do. I thought to myself, how kind of him. And dude, the emotional manipulation required to make me like Caleb for even one second in this book, I, I felt sick to my stomach. Again, you have like spitting on her and violence on one hand and then you have this and coloring on the other hand like what do I believe what is this characterization I'm not sitting here thinking to myself wow he sure does contain multitudes I'm sitting here afraid and confused I don't trust people who act like this and neither should you anyway so Noah's just watching this when all of a sudden he smells smoke and he goes down to investigate and it turns out that the barn outside is on fire just randomly in the middle of the night so yeah he calls for Caleb and everybody runs downstairs to check out the burning barn because also the stable is right next to the barn and all of their homestead farm animals are just like chilling there about to get cooked it's not looking very good and everybody is freaking out because the pipes are frozen so they don't really have a hose that they can just like put out the fire with but what they do have is a backyard water tower so Tiernan's like go check it out guys and see if it's frozen you know like it was warm two days ago anything could happen and Caleb instantly hops in and fires up what I thought was a snowmobile when I was reading this initially but when I was doing my second read through I looked it up and apparently it's like a construction vehicle it's an excavator that they just like had on hand and this man just drives it straight into the water tower to tip the water tower into the barn and put out the fire. A plan that I would say has holes, but it works somehow. It puts out the fire in the barn, the water just falls in the perfect necessary way for it to all be fine. But at some point during this chaos of getting the horses out of the way of the elements, Tiernan ended up injured. She has this large cut now on her arm. And apparently this cut is like super deep to the point where it's pretty dangerous, but there's no potential for medical attention, obviously. They're at the mountain mansion. They're snow people. You can't go up or down. We've been over this. And so instead of getting actual medical attention, Tiernan ends up getting homemade stitches, just raw. There are no painkillers in sight. She ends up taking two shots of tequila to kind of take her mind off of what's about to happen. You have to do it, Noah says, handing me the bottle again. If you don't, you might get an infection, and then you'll wish you were dead. And as you might imagine, this, like, entire process is just incredibly painful. So to help, Caleb just slaps her in the face really hard, just to, like, help her focus on a different kind of pain to take her mind off of the stitches in her arm. And that distraction works well enough, apparently. So Noah just starts, like, pulling her hair as she's getting stitches, and Caleb slaps her a couple more times. And then Noah just starts making out with her. He sings his teeth into my neck, squeezing me. And just as I feel the pinch of Caleb's needle, I grab the back of Noah's head and turn into him, breathing in and out hard against his lips. Tiernan, Noah whispers, and I taste salt, but I'm not sure if it's his tear or mine. I love you. You're so f***ing ours. We love you. <laughs> Whoa! Yeah, just also as a distraction, you know, as they teach you in medical school. I'm sure this is just first aid. Anyways, stitch, stitch, it's done, it's over. And yet, it has just begun. Tiernan afterwards looks at Caleb and is like, You could have warned me, I tell Caleb, my voice thick with tears as I stare down at him. You could have hit me anywhere else. Which, like, honestly, good point. Important questions to ask. Tell me you hate women without telling me you hate women. Caleb says nothing, obviously. He never says anything. It's kind of his whole thing. And Tiernan thinks a couple more thoughts about this situation. I've seen him abusive. Throwing things, spitting, not taking no for an answer. He slapped me without any hesitation tonight. But 
the dogs love him most, don't they? They follow him, sleep with him, and make him smile when he doesn't think we see. Tiernan, stop this. Stop with this this instant, okay? You cannot let the propaganda work on you. What do you mean the dogs love him most? That is just the most insane reason in the world to assume the best in someone who you have literally seen punch the wall next to your head, spit on you. But the dogs though, they just love him. Seriously, reading this I felt yet again like I was in the twilight zone. I want Jake, I whisper to myself. He's not who had your tongue in his mouth minutes ago. Noah spits out, looking over his shoulder at me as he fills a pitcher. You liked us then. Which like, I guess you have her there because she's just immediately convinced by this. And it's at this point that Tiernan decides to continue her swift descent into Dante's Inferno. And she starts telling Noah about how she's always wanted him and about how she loves to watch him cook. And that one day in the shower, yeah, remember that scene from what feels like years of my life ago. That one day in the shower, I wanted you even then. So you know what? Might as well. And Noah and Caleb are like, gang gang, sounds great. Let's do this. But first, let's give her a bath. And they braid her hair in the bath. And it just all has some subtext that I don't like at all. We take care of her pretty good, he tells Caleb, reaching around me to squeeze hot water over my she doesn't need daddy do you quotes brought to you from this book by the way with again just exceptional care because 90 percent of that page is not fair game but soon the bath is over and they decide to move on to other things say yes to us noah whispers against my mouth i stare up at him quiet for a moment if we do this we might not be able to come back from it i don't want to lose them as if the line was not already crossed on like page 25 with this family but whatever anyways obviously she says yes we took care of you noah says quirking a smile as he through his genes too. Now, take care of us. The physics of what follows between the three of them can only be described as anti-science. Just the things that the three of them do together are a part of this world that I truly wish had remained a mystery to me. Anyways, Tiernan comes out of this experience feeling like a million bucks, and I come out of this experience feeling like I should start attending mass. And you really would think that in a book that has already gone like so far off of the deep end that it's become hard to articulate, you really would think that she would just get to exist at the mountain mansion forever with all three of her evil jail-worthy relatives. But because we need more drama, there's just not enough drama yet, there's not enough plot, that's not how this is about to go. The day after that really cool event between the three of them, Tiernan's in the bathroom about to take a shower when out of nowhere appears Caleb who just says nothing as he is wants to do and takes out a med kit to help clean her stitches. And once again, I'm encouraging you not to fall for the propaganda here during this wound cleaning scene because truly out of nowhere, all of a sudden Tiernan is just incredibly down bad for this man. I felt it, I whisper again. I felt him and how it was perfect and how I wanted him to fold me up inside him forever. It was a perfect moment when all of me aligned for one instant and I felt full and strong Wrong. Those moments are rare. And this is specifically to do with Caleb, by the way. It has nothing to do with Noah, who was also in those scenes. Poor guy. But yeah, Caleb responds to Tiernan whispering to him about how like special the moment was for her last night by grunting and looking pain. And then when she thinks he's gonna leave after he's done with the wound cleaning scene, he just like lays his head down into her lap and she's like, yeah, see, I get him. I got him to speak through his actions. Loving them has made something inside me wake up and I don't want to go back to being who I was. I might wish this change could have happened differently, but some of us don't learn from the heats. We need the fire. Just in what universe you need to smash your entire step family in order to self-actualize. I just don't think that this is what Frederick was talking about when he was like, we need the storm, the whirlwind, the earthquake. Anyways, also out of nowhere, surprise, Who's home early? It's Uncle Jake after just one night at the hunting cabin. Apparently the snow was just too much for him and it was really windy, so he just turned around and came home. And this man looks at the situation and is like, I leave you three alone for one night and you burn down half of the barn, you drive the excavator into the water tower. How dare you? What are you guys doing? Like, you're all stupid. And Tiernan, who, if you recall from her interaction with Cece, is a subscriber to the School of Radical Honesty. She's like, yeah, so you've been home for 30 seconds and I feel like it's time I tell you that while you were gone for one night, I smashed both of your sons at the same time time. Were they good to you? My eyes water and I nod. He's not yelling. I'm not sure if I'm hurt that he's not jealous or thankful that he's not disgusted with me, but he is jealous. His hard expression and clipped words tell me that. I open my mouth to explain. I love him, but I don't know. I drop my head. I have no idea how to explain any of this or what I feel with them. It just never feels wrong. That's all I know. I, did you finish those college applications yet? <laughs> and whatever you feel when I read quotes like that between these characters, I just hope you know that you're not alone. Just having that reaction to this news, some would call it puzzling. It's a parenting style that really leaves something to be desired, I would say, and I'll leave it at that. Anyways, so Uncle Jake ends up helping Tiernan into the shower because of her injury, I guess. I mean, it's on her arm and also stitched up 
up, it doesn't seem to impact her mobility at all, but he sure does help her anyways. And against all odds, he actually manages to resist the temptation here and he leaves the bathroom. And Tiernan finally, inside of her internal monologue, makes the vow to herself to never do this again. Like she is done smashing her step family. It is over, pull the curtains. Truly just bold of her to suggest that with 100 pages left in this book. But you know, again, I respect her for these brief moments of clarity, I do. Anyways, they all have family breakfast together and apparently Caleb has hung up all of Tiernan's furniture drawings on the fridge just for everybody to see, you know? It's like the opposite of what Tiernan's parents would have done. And obviously Tiernan finds this to be very nice of him, but do not fall for this, okay? You're better than thinking this man is cute. It turns out also that Uncle Jake has since investigated this mysterious fire and it turns out that it started in the loft of the barn, which means that it was not random. It seems like somebody's come up the mountain and started the fire. More on that soon. Okay, for the next section, I just want to give you guys a warning that if we weren't already there, we're definitely now entering the Rand's review part of this recap. I honestly just can't believe that even a book with these like rock bottom talking points somehow found a way to let me down this badly. Tiernan goes out to the barn and she works on her furniture for a little while. She's a craftswoman, if you recall. And then she sees like a pine tree outside and she decides to make a Christmas tree topper, you know, to make the place kind of feel like home as they rapidly approach the holiday season. And when she gets out there to grab some sticks and pine cones or whatever, Caleb just appears behind her and starts helping by slicing some twigs off the tree and putting them in the pile in Tiernan's hands. And Tiernan this entire time is thinking about how down bad she is for this man. Once again, a fact that sprouted so quickly out of nothing that it just fills me with a simmering rage, the likes of which have never been seen before. With Noah and Jake, I can see the future. I know what will happen. But with Caleb, there's nothing. I can't see the last five minutes because the feelings evolve. He changes me. I'm afraid I'll lose my foothold. I don't want to go back to being who I was. Scared, waiting, unsure. I don't want anyone to have so much power over my emotions again. So yeah, Tiernan obviously sees Caleb as the biggest threat to her newfound celibacy, where she just decided that she maybe shouldn't be smashing her stepfamily all of the time. And so she knows that this is not the move to be alone with him. But they continue working together until Tiernan is holding like this massive pile of sticks that somehow I guess she's going to turn into a tree topper. And then Caleb walks up behind her, he takes off her hat for some reason, and he just smashes that entire pile of sticks out of her hands for some reason, like he's 12 before he just shoves her towards the barn. This is how he is. A breeze one minute, a cyclone the next. He does exactly what he wants. Yes, Tiernan, you're correct. And this is, dare I say, not a good trait. I twist my head away. No kissing, not this time. Tightening his fingers, he jerks me into him again, bringing his mouth down, but he only gets within an inch. I hold myself back, shaking my head. No, the heat of his scowl burns my skin. He grabs me by the jaw and I clench my teeth as he forces my face up, his lips crashing down on mine. His mouth sears in his rage, but I seal myself, keeping my lips closed as I push him away. Caleb, no, I choke out. No kissing. Yeah, remember when the author temporarily tried to gaslight us into thinking that this guy was just so sweet and nice because f dogs liked him? That's the evidence we need, remember that? I don't have to be the one to tell you that what is happening in this scene is terrible. We both know this to be true, okay? And I just so wish that this didn't get any worse than that, but it does. Long story short, to cut out pages of paragraphs that I can never unread, she ends up basically giving in and being like, yeah, I mean, we can do other stuff, but just please do not kiss me. And just like it always goes in this book, this entire endeavor continues on until Tiernan eventually is just just like, I can't fight him anymore. I want to kiss him and feel what I felt last night. As if this was completely her idea and secretly she always felt this way, even though moments before she was vocally trying to push Caleb off of her. Like what? Caleb does not have access to this internal monologue, okay? What he's doing is criminal. It's like actually a crime. And you really think that after everything that's already happened in this book, it can't go any lower until you realize during this scene that she is en route to selecting Caleb. It's like her options were eating a cockroach, licking the wall of a public restroom, and then just amputating all of her limbs. And Tiernan thought to herself, she's like, wow, that's a really hard choice, but I just gotta go with having no arms or legs. Like, what? What do you mean? Who are you? It's just really difficult for me to capture the fury that this directorial decision inspired within me. And you know what? Like, it's not even the worst part. Minor intermission as we reach the end of this book, we're just gonna start to get this small collection of nonsense subplots, just for fun, because Penelope Douglas really said, yeah, my step family reverse harem, it needs to be 470 pages. It can't be any shorter. There's nothing I can take out. And first on that list, we get a lawsuit. Some like random TMZ vibes newspaper apparently published an article about how Tiernan's dad abused Tiernan's mom and like forced Tiernan's mom to take her own life, which Tiernan knows for a fact is not true, again, considering the entire cartoonishly evil backstory about how her parents loved each other more than they loved her. And this TMZ article makes her so mad that she ends up calling her lawyers a wealthy heiress moments. And they're like, yeah, did you want us to send them a cease and desist? And she's like, no. And they're like, a retraction? And she's like, no, I want to make an example out of them. And she just has her lawyers essentially sue TMZ for libel. So that's happening in the background here. We're never going to learn how that's resolved, but I just felt like it was important to bring up. Okay, pausing on the subject,
subplots because there are more later, but Tiernan has finally finished this mysterious Christmas tree topper ornament, and she has a really cool chat with Noah. What happens when you leave? He asks. My eyes start to sting. I'm not leaving for months. I don't want to think about this now. What if I never let you leave? He murmurs, his breath tickling my lips. What if his arms circle my waist and he pulls me in tight? What if a lot changed before the summer? What if he grabs my bottom lip between his teeth, making me suck in a breath before he releases it? What if we p you until you were pregnant? He whispers. To keep me here? I challenge, knocking me up on purpose, but he shakes his head. To keep you with me. Yeah, remember when you thought for like 10 pages that Noah was pretty normal in comparison to the rest of the cast? I remember that. I remember feeling that way. I open my mouth to speak, but I don't know what to say. Noah is who I should be with, if anyone. He's young, kind, attentive. He talks to me. He's good. So why don't I tell him that? I think this one almost speaks for itself. Like imagine a man saying that to you and your response is to gaze at him with yearning and sadly wonder why you aren't in love with such a kind and attentive person. It's not for us to understand. There's just no other explanation than that. Anyways, Caleb, her one true love, despite his wordlessness and also overall worthlessness, I would argue, he approaches the two of them as they're having this conversation and starts like stroking a lock of Tiernan's hair and he jerks his chin to order Noah to leave the room, which Noah does because he's a beta. And Caleb pushes her backwards into her bedroom. But instead of following her there, I know that's probably what you were expecting. It's actually much worse because he closes the door and then locks it from the outside. I yank and pull on the door, beating it with the hands of my healthy arm. This isn't funny. He bolted my door. There wasn't a bolt in it this morning. When did he put it on? Is he kidding? Oh my God. Actually deranged behavior, like reason maybe number 12 or 13 so far that this man belongs in prison. And Tiernan keeps yelling for a second, which is reasonable, but Uncle Jake and Noah are like working on something in the garage, so they don't hear her. And it's like 9 p.m. at this point, so eventually she's just like, whatever, I'll go to bed, you know, in my jail. I guess just as you do when you find yourself in your situation, as I'm sure you guys do all of the time. Time. But the next chapter, truly just one of the most deplorable things that I have read in fiction, the sequence of events. It's from Caleb's perspective, but Caleb doesn't speak. Ha ha ha, it's kind of his thing. So it's in third person instead of first, but we still get his thoughts, which it turns out are just like incel talking points. He's sick of her sleeping around, him today in the barn, letting his father touch her and kiss her tonight, and then about to give it up for his brother when his back is turned. He's sick of seeing her smile when she works on her dumb sh in the shop, sick of her excited by the snow or happy when she feeds the horses, sick of seeing her hair fall across her cheek as she reads at the dinner table, or how she twists her lips to the side when she's concentrating on an assignment. Sick of her cries at night and how pathetic she sounds during her nightmares. Just say you hate women, okay? Say it. I'm ready. I can take it. But dogs like him, by the way. Dogs like him, so it's fine that these are the thoughts that are inside of his head because dogs just innately know that he's a good dude. Caleb enters her room as she is sleeping. In fact, she's actively having a nightmare. And Caleb slips under the covers of her bed and while she is still asleep, he just starts doing his thing. What thing? You know what thing because this man has been carrying a neon sign this entire book about how bad of a person he is. And truly up there for one of the most heartbreaking moments in this book for me is when she wakes up up because like obviously she does and she looks at him and she goes I don't know how to talk sometimes either she tells him this is how we talk this is the only time I feel like you like me once again this isn't just the taboo okay I want to make it so clear why I hate this book more than maybe anything else that I have ever read just to have your clearly end game book boyfriends do this on like page 400 and the protagonist her initial reaction is like this is how we connect like on god this is what it's all for I feel like I'm living on a different planet from anybody who likes these characters I've almost never hated anyone in a book like I hate Caleb he's up there with Ben from November 9. He honestly might even be worse. That's a discussion for a different day. But anyways, I'm not going to summarize because it is despicable and unnecessary, but the rest of the scene, do just trust me, it doesn't get better. In fact, in terms of consent, it actually gets a lot worse, especially given the fact that we started from like zero, so I'll let you connect the dots on that one, but it's just really, really bad. Anyways, after that horror movie, Tiernan manages to escape and she runs into Noah's room and locks the door behind her. And Noah's concerned about this development, as one would be. He's like, are you good? And she's like, nah, I'm not good. So Noah decides that now is the perfect time to give us Caleb's tragic backstory. Let's find out why he is the way he is. Remember how their mom is in prison? Yeah, so it turns out that she was just really into benders and substances and just getting crazy and being irresponsible. And one day she went to a party and just left Caleb outside in the car when he was like four years old and she locked her doors, she prepared to do her thing. And mom goes on to ingest so many different substances during this bender that she dissociates for four entire days. And this whole time, four-year-old Caleb is still in this car and nobody knows where he is. Uncle Jake has no idea. He was alone in the car with no one around for miles to hear him call out or cry when the minutes turned into hours and hours into days. There was no food in the car and the only water came from the leak in the roof when it rained. Anyways, eventually Uncle Jake is able to locate him and rescue him from this situation. Mom ends up going to jail, presumably for that reason, but also Tiernan suspects other reasons, at least in theory. I mean, we never find out what the deal is with that completely 
why would we want to know? But yeah, Caleb decides to never talk again because it feels like the one thing in his life that he can control after that experience, you know, like his decision about whether or not to communicate with the world. Oh, and also he hates women now because they remind him of his mom. And that's it. That's that. Obviously, it's a terrible story. Like, you hate to see it. Going through that as a kid, for sure, it would cause problems, I think, in your life as you grow up. But Tiernan hears this, and within, like, one page, she's thinking to herself, he acts wrong. He treated me wrong tonight. I'm confused, too. I'm making mistakes, too. But I don't want to hurt him. All I know for sure is that I can be there. Maybe over time, he'll trust me as a friend. I'm sorry. Look, it sucks. Like, that's childhood trauma. I apologize, my dude. Like, nobody deserves to go through that experience. But I really do not think that being locked in a car for four days 20 years ago makes it, like, Jay Chillin understandable for you to assault women. Radical take. I know. It's out of left field. I know a lot of you guys are going to disagree with me. It just happens when I say something that is this controversial, you know? But seriously, the way that she just instantly forgives him or is willing to forgive him more on that soon, it makes me sick to my stomach. Do not forget this as we finish out this book, because the narrative sure will, but this is just an insane five-page stretch. It's an emotional roller coaster that not only has zero realism at all, but also completely delegitimizes what Caleb did to Tiernan. For the record, several times, but especially this time, just because he had it really tough when he was four. I just, to make this entire book be how it is, and then have her fall for him at the end, God, it just makes me so mad. Like, this is the most unforgivable part of this book for me. Again, stiff competition, as you have seen. Anyways, Tiernan goes to find Caleb, so that way she can comfort him. That's what happens next. But she can't even comfort him properly because it turns out that when Noah was telling Tiernan about Caleb's tortured past, Caleb ran out to the barn. And remember all of that furniture that Tiernan has been refurbishing and designing? He went outside and he sledgehammered slash set the pieces that they did together on fire. Well adjusted and non-threatening behavior from our leading man. Way to continue making Caleb a likable and redeemable character. Just at every turn in this book. Wow. Tiernan sees this and she has like a mental break because this reminds her of when her cartoonishly evil parents would throw away her drawings as a kid. Again, something that Caleb knew, by the way. So Tiernan just rips a pipe from the wall and starts smashing her bookshelf, another one of her designs, into pieces. Until Uncle Jake, of all people, walks in on this and he's like, dude, stop, like, what is going on? And Caleb just looks at Tiernan as she is calming down, being held back from continuing to destroy her own property by Uncle Jake. He says mine in sign language and then he just turns around and walks into the woods. No prep at all, it seems. It's the middle of winter, by the way, but just off he goes. And with that, Caleb is gone for a little while and we get some time skips, weeks are passing, home on the range. Tiernan's still pretty mad about things, so she says to Noah and Uncle Jake that she is leaving in April as soon as the snow melts. And the two of them are like, why ever would you do that? This is your home. We love you. Which, cursed. It's just really cursed. So what did you think? I'd bed hop every night for the rest of my life as if we weren't all completely insane. I was never going to stay. A fair question. That's another moment of sanity for Tiernan, maybe number four for this book. We would have backed off, Jake says. Caleb is in love with you. Uncle Jake has a dark hole where the front of his brain should be, and I mean that disrespectfully. The morticians who embalm his body will be shocked when his head just collapses into itself. After the hot air of bullshit and horniness that is constantly inflating his skull fades away into the ether after death. He wasn't right, and he communicates by losing his temper. He was wrong, yes, but he was hurt. The only woman he ever loved forgot about him, almost killed him. He's in love with you, Tiernan. He was jealous. Why are we spending even more pages justifying Caleb? Like, why is this book so fixated on giving him a redemption arc when it could have done literally anything else? Anyways, Tiernan, something of, if you recall, a craftswoman. Even after witnessing the destruction of her furniture, she can only refrain from continuing to craft for so long. And in her rage at this entire situation, she has this realization. She wants to live. She wants to do her thing. And she doesn't care what anybody else thinks anymore, okay? She does things only for her. Time skip after this interaction yet again, and two months have passed. Two full months are gone, and Caleb is still doing woods. Nobody knows what he's doing in there. He's never come back for supplies. Could in fact be dead if that wasn't far too convenient for this absolute train wreck of a novel. But Tiernan, meanwhile, she's been on her grind, okay? She's made five pieces of furniture, and she's applied to college. High school, by the way, need I remind you. And Tiernan also, in this time, has committed herself completely to the Herculean task of resisting smashing her relatives. And she's been very good at it. She stayed strong. She's also been ghosting PA slash mother figure Mirai for obvious and understandable reasons, honestly. Like, I don't really know how I would go about that conversation. Just updating her on the happenings in my life if I were Tiernan. But Mirai finally calls and gets a hold of her. And while they're talking, Uncle Jake elbows her and is like, is she hot? Which is really just another eroded brain moment for the books. And Noah, the beta, is still like, please, please come shower with me, please. And Tiernan's like, no. And he's like, oh man, rats. And he just scurries away. Tiernan feels responsible and also guilty that Caleb is gone. Again, a decision that was made by this author with the way that this book was written. And in her sadness, she goes up to his room and just kind of hangs out there, peruses, does some snooping, and Caleb has these like massive wall-to-wall -wall bookshelves. And Tiernan assumed the first time that she was up there that he was just a really big reader. But this time she actually grabs a book and she realizes that not a single spine in this library is broken in, according to Tiernan. He's potentially never read a book in his entire life. And instead, Caleb's grand secret is that he's been writing diary entries inside of the covers of all of these books. And all of these journal entries 
countries are shelved at the border. So the first one that Tiernan finds says, It's funny how women come to me so easily now. They used to say I was stupid in school. Stupid. 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 I am stupid but they sure like to f me. And Tiernan is like, oh my God, like he does have a voice, wow. And she runs around and she reads some more entries. And some of them are about her in a positive way. Saw her smile again today. She turned her face toward the sky and closed her eyes. She likes it here. I can tell by her smile when she doesn't know anyone sees her. She always exhales when she does that, like she's been holding her breath. And some are less positive. Why can't I leave? It's time to go in. I've been here too long. That f slut. That stupid slut. And Tiernan learns in these entries that Caleb had been the one who was coming in every night to help with her nightmares. She learns that he didn't actually hit Cece in that cave. Remember that? It feels like 10 years ago. And this experience changes her entire life. Like, all is forgiven. Why be mad when your man has revealed himself to be literate? All this time, I pushed it away, trying to survive and act like I could win. But he's right. It's a mess and we're a mess. But I always knew that if you walked through the door and said anything to me or communicated in any way, I'd melt. All I've ever wanted was one glimpse into his head. Bar is in hell. Bar is with Hades. Bar is so deep through the center of this earth that we've tunneled all the way through and into the sun. The fact that this book ended up with me thinking to myself, man, I sure do wish she'd stayed smashing her uncle. Should tell you everything that you need to know about my opinion of this book, about the dark places that this story took me. This incredibly unfortunate realization of her love for Caleb inspires Tiernan, of course, to go and get him. So she goes and grabs Noah as her plus one, and off they go into the snow, to woods, to the hunting cabin where they think that Caleb has been living. And as they're going there, because obviously it would be this way, the weather suddenly turns and it begins thunderstorming. Lightning is striking directly directly in front of them, like toppling trees almost into Noah. And Noah, for the record, also has barely any idea of where they are or where they're going, considering the fact that he hasn't been to the hunting cabin since he was like 12. The two of them just have this map that neither of them can really read because Jake made it and he sucks at art and drawing. So they're truly just navigating by vibe. And it starts like hailing snowballs during this thunderstorm, but miraculously they're able to find a cave, which even more miraculously ends up being a tunnel that leads directly to the cabin. So they get up there and it turns out that Caleb has in fact been around recently. Like they can tell because there's a pot that was left out or something. But at that moment, he is gone. Where'd he go? No one knows. They kind of assume he's dead because of the active thunderstorm outside. So that's not ideal, but eventually they just end up deciding to go to bed. So that way they can look for him the next day. But it turns out that Caleb was just on like a mini woods field trip going hunting, maybe. I don't know. He doesn't have any animals with him. We'll never find out how he survived the storm, but he just pulls up the next morning when Tiernan's like being sad and making eye contact with the deer. And Noah's gone at that moment. He's like catching a rabbit or something for breakfast. And Tiernan turns around, she sees Caleb and she's like, you missed Christmas. Please come home. Home. And Caleb says nothing. It's it's kind of his thing. He just strolls up and goes in for the kiss. And within like two paragraphs, they're smashing. There's been no one since you, I whisper. Maybe he doesn't need to hear it, but I want him to know. Tiernan hits him with the I love you, and Caleb says nothing in return. Seriously, in this scene, more than most of Caleb's scenes in this book, he's just like an entity. He's not even really a person. Like he has no characterization in this moment. He's just a body and nothing else. Noah gets back with the rabbit or whatever, but ha ha ha. Caleb and Tiernan have locked the door to the cabin. And Noah's like, come on, guys, it's cold out here. But they don't stop. It's just, it's a funny sitcom moment to round out the chapter. The next morning comes around and while Tiernan is just watching Caleb sleep, she notices a tattoo. What's the tattoo, you ask? Credence. The, the tattoo says Credence. Tiernan helpfully provides us with a definition here. Credence. I'm close enough to read it now. It means belief as to the truth of something. <sighs> You're wondering why he has this? We're never gonna find out. They're never gonna have a conversation about it. When Caleb wakes up, Tiernan does a little bit of cool psychoanalysis of him with his abandonment issues. They really consider smashing again with Noah sleeping like two inches from them, but bravely they decide not to. And then she reads to him a little bit from a book that he has at the cabin. Immediately after this, two more weeks have passed. Caleb is back at the normal house and things are mostly fine. Uncle Jake seems to be in kind of a mood, but Tiernan just can't figure out why. I haven't had a chance to talk to him. Caleb and I are always together. Or Caleb makes sure we're always together. Not that I choose to have it in any other way. I just hope he trusts that I'm well aware of who I'm in love with, and he doesn't need to worry about his father and brother around me. Just imagine that being a problem in your relationship. The fact that you had historically smashed both your boyfriend's brother and his dad. Just imagine the vibes four beers into the wedding reception. Anyways, Tiernan finally has this conversation with Uncle Jake, in which he just deflects and ends up saying, just don't get pregnant. You're only 18. And also it turns out that his moods are not even because of jealousy with Tiernan and Caleb. They're apparently because Mirai has been calling him a lot with questions about Tiernan, and the two of them have been bantering. And it was in this moment that I realized that not even cool girl PA mother figure cuddles during Nightmares Mirai was going to get out of this book unscathed. But that's a fun subplot for later. Time skip two more months to when the snow is melting and things are finally changing again on the mountain. As soon as the roads open, Mirai is supposed to be visiting Tiernan and she's also just kind of feeling weird about that self-imposed deadline of leaving. And we open this chapter with Tiernan finally getting her period and being like, gee whiz, thank God I'm not pregnant, ha ha ha, because she was a couple of days late. But then she looks in the mirror and she has a cheeky daydream about 
of Barry and Caleb's children that just made me want to throw myself off of a bridge. And she's like making the pregnancy emoji pose in the bathroom mirror when Caleb and Noah like quote tumble through the door onto the floor. Okay and they see her and she's like no guys like it's cool don't worry I'm not pregnant. And Caleb so cool and likable just walks past her. He opens the medicine cabinet, he takes her birth control, and he just throws it away into the trash. And the two of them have this really cool scene together where Tiernan fishes her birth control out of the trash and she's like no Caleb you can't do that. And Caleb just tugs it out of her hand and throws it away again. Yeah just very fun stuff. Anyways now that the roads are mounted the two of them end up going into town to get some candy when nonsense subplot alert Cece appears. Remember her from the dance floor in the cave with the injury that was later confirmed to not be Caleb? Yeah Cece shows up and she is like super pregnant. I jerk my eyes to Caleb seeing his jaw flex and his chest rise and fall in shallow breaths. How far along is she? We've been away from town for six months. I look over my shoulder again to see her saunter up to us. Let me guess, she says. You're going through the math in your head right now. She smirks, looking between us. We'll be in touch, she whispers to Caleb. And then Cece just like saunters away. And Tiernan obviously freaks out. She's like, is it yours? Like, did you know about this? What if, as a treat, you tried communicating with me in any capacity at all? You could even write something to me. I know you're capable of doing that. And Caleb is just not prepared for this challenge. So he says and does nothing, of course. And Tiernan ends up getting on the back of Noah's bike and just driving straight back to the house in a bleary haze of emotion. God, the ending of this book is just so ridiculous to me. They all get back to the mountain and they have this tearful confrontation where Tiernan is like, you threw away my birth control because it was a convenient solution to this problem. This is how you can trap me. Just ripping into him as Caleb essentially just sweats uncomfortably. And Uncle Jake walks into this and he's like, excuse me, I had one rule for you guys. But then they're interrupted because the photographers have arrived. And for some reason, Tiernan is modeling for this like skimpy photo shoot for the dirt bike company that Uncle Jake runs. I don't know, okay, but it's her and Noah like on bikes for a second and she leans back into him and he's wearing no shirt because of course not too close someone tells Gino she's his cousin Noah snorts his chest shaking against my back I clench my teeth it's not funny it's hilarious I roll my eyes the cousins in this house are so much closer than they realize my hips are the least of what Noah has touched <laughs> You think you've seen it all. <laughs> After the shoot, Uncle Jake and Noah and Caleb go into town to talk to Cece about Caleb's apparent spawn and also to quote, deal with the sheriff, presumably so Caleb doesn't get arrested when he destroyed all of that property by just running over 13 dirt bikes six months ago. And Tiernan, of course, is very sad. She's very mopey and she has prepared herself to leave forever. Tiernan decides to write Caleb a letter before she just disappears in the night. The letter is ridiculous and I hate it. Some excerpts. You were the one I should be with because I finally liked myself and I liked how you pushed me because it made me push back. You made me learn how to demand. You're at the bar with them now and I'm alone in your room knowing I should keep packing my suitcase but not wanting to because the highs with you are so good. I don't want it to stop. But the lows, the lows are like I'm nine again and still waiting for them to love me. I think you loved me though and I love you. I was yours that first night when you took me in your arms in the shop and you didn't even know my name. <laughs> Tiernan drops off that letter and stands up to leave forever, but before she can go, she notices that the horses outside are apparently freaking out, and she goes to investigate this, and she's like, what could this be? What could be occurring? Turns out, it's Terrence from 350 pages ago. We didn't invite you onto the property. I bite out. No one wants to see you here. There's no one here except you, though. He says, eerily calm, you're all alone, right? And Terrence, it turns out, has pulled up to the mountain mansion to try to bully Tiernan into sponsoring his dirt bike career. And this career was apparently once promising, but everything fell apart for them when Caleb just ran over all of their bikes outside of that bar. But Tiernan, being a wealthy heiress, she can fix everything for them. And obviously she doesn't want to do this, so she just like bolts into the house. Uncle Jake calls her like right in this moment for some reason, and she picks up and just puts the on phone inside of her pocket. And as she enters the house, apparently Terrence has brought some of his goons to threaten her. So she just like screams at them in hopes of surreptitiously alerting Uncle Jake to the happenings on the mountain. Terrence lets himself in behind her and sweetens this hypothetical deal by offering himself up as a friend with benefits. I'm not romantic. I won't be faithful, but I'll be at your beck and call. You can push me around all you want. Really a fascinating negotiation tactic, but Tiernan just whips out a knife and goes, I'm thinking you remind me of my father. People like you hurt the soul. Tiernan de Haas. I'm a Vanderberg, I growl, correcting him and launching the knife. Terrence dodges the knife and Tiernan ends up turning around and sprinting back into the shop where she hides behind one of her pieces of furniture. And as she's hiding, we get the villain monologue because it turns out that it was Terrence and the goons who came in and burned down that barn forever ago just to like mess with Tiernan and the Vanderberg men. And Terrence and his goons also make the decision to steal all of the bikes that are still in the shop and then burn it down after they convince Tiernan to give them money. A foolproof plan with just no potential for failure, obviously. And Tiernan arms herself with that pink bow that Uncle Jay got her for her birthday and she stands up and she shoots at them, grazing one guy in the shoulder. This is not Katniss Everdeen. She is not very good, apparently. And she misses 
this is her next shot before she starts running away and she gets into the house and up like three flights of stairs into Caleb's room notches another arrow into the Barbie bow and this time successfully manages to shoot Terrence like squarely in the shoulder and at this point he and his goons surrender and Terrence just starts sadly waddling down the stairs right as Uncle Jake Caleb and Noah show back up at the house they all call the police and the sheriff who I guess has been recently placated by Uncle Jake and does not seem to see Caleb as a threat at all anymore the sheriff takes Tiernan's statement about how Terrence lit the fire etc etc the ambulance comes to pick him up and bring him to the hospital and then after that presumably jail and Caleb this entire time is sulking because he has noticed Tiernan's suitcase by the door Noah also tells Tiernan that Uncle Jake was apparently able to bully Cece's doctor into telling him when Cece got pregnant which is insane you know like HIPAA or whatever but this child is not in fact Caleb's because he was just doing woods the entire month of August and apparently she got pregnant in August so impossible to be his Cece was just lying for fun I guess and it turns out that her actual baby daddy was Terrence about to be jailed so you hate to see that anyways Mirai also pulls up into the situation after managing somehow to book an earlier connection for her flight and also a rental car and Tiernan is still feeling kind of sad about Caleb obviously so she's like hey Mirai you know I'll meet you in town okay I just have to handle this real quick but as she is having this conversation with Mirai Caleb goes inside grabs her suitcase and just opens the back door of Mirai's rental car and puts the suitcase in the seat and then he walks over and opens the passenger seat door and just kind of like stares at her I hold his beautiful green eyes seeing the emotion behind that he tries to hide but as I try to search for what to say to solve this to save us there are no words left maybe words were never really the problem actions speak louder don't they say and his are loud and clear yes Tiernan that has been the case this entire book but with that she gets in the car and Mirai drives them towards the airport and away from this accursed house in the car ride to the airport Tiernan apparently tells Mirai everything they're my family I say my voice gentle we were forced together and it happened as if this entire situation is something that can just happen to people sometimes on the reg and I don't even really blame Mirai for being like flabbergasted at this revelation just imagine that after like months of flirting with a fellow grown middle-aged man slash also the step uncle of your surrogate daughter you find out that he took her virginity in the back of a truck while wearing like fluorescent orange hunting gear I would never trust a man ever again it would be over for me like just truly what do you do in this situation Tiernan convinces her not to go to the cops with this and the two of them just go back to Tiernan's original mansion that she now has inherited from her parents it is sad she's emotional she like puts their ashes into the ground underneath what was once the tire swing that Mirai cut down at the beginning of the book and also she is confirmed a gajillionaire like she gets all of the money and possessions in the mansion and stuff we end up getting a six week time skip and Noah pulls up to the mansion as promised to start his grand motorbike career and he finds Tiernan just hanging out at this random beach because apparently Uncle Jake had secretly installed a tracking app on her phone like a year prior at the beginning of this book pretty cool stuff it's really fun nothing phases me anymore at this point in this book Noah also tells Tiernan that apparently Caleb went and did more woods after she left he went to the cabin like the day after never to return and now that Noah is with Tiernan he's going to be starting his brave new career and they have like a really weird last emotional part of the conversation let's not talk about him what about you are you happy he looks down at me and I wonder why it couldn't be him he's so easy to love do you resent me I whisper when he doesn't answer he hoods his eyes a gentle smile curling his lips you were right Tiernan I was in love but with something else racing I have my future now he tells me I'm really happy which good for him I guess I don't know it's weird whatever anyways they hang out for the rest of the day and then they go back to Tiernan's mansion and who's at this mansion it's Uncle Jake bantering with Mirai and flirting with her and you know I don't even blame him for this at this point okay like he has no frontal lobe we know this to be true at this point but the absolute audacity of Mirai to be putting up with this knowing what she knows imagine knowing all of the nitty-gritty about what happened between your surrogate daughter and her step uncle and coming out of it thinking to yourself yeah that's husband material I trusted you why are you your surrogate daughter's sloppy seconds like how do you even end up in this position how will you explain this to your family I just in a book that is unrealistic to the point of it belonging in a museum if one existed for such things this is maybe the most unrealistic part once again nobody comes out of this book unscathed anyways Tiernan goes to bed but in the middle of the night she ends up waking up because of a mysterious sound outside of her window and she gets up and she looks outside and she sees that the tire swing has been hung up again except with a different tire so she goes outside to investigate and who is it who Who's there? Any guesses? Anyone want to chime in on what you think the happily ever after of this book is? Yep it's Caleb and Tiernan of course at this point is extremely excited to be seeing him she's like wow like I can't believe he had it in him to leave the mountain even one time in his life and she asks him how he got here and he says nothing he just kind of starts pushing her on the tire swing which is kind of tender if you separate it from literally everything else that happens in this book and she's like how could you have possibly known that I had so much internalized tire swing related trauma and he just pulls out a piece of paper from his pocket and hands it to her and it's this newspaper printout of an article about her parents that just has a picture of her parents on the tire swing and Tiernan being sad at like age seven 
Evan looking out at them from the window, which is kind of cute, I guess. I mean, I still f hate him. Anyways, you knew this was coming. I can't believe you're here, I tell him just above a whisper. You actually left Colorado. It was time he says, my home is where you are. And it turns out that when he did Woods this time for that six week period, he took that book that Tunin had read to him that one time and he just started grinding, learning how to talk by reading it to himself like over and over again, just until his vocal cords started working and he was able to do it. So that's that. They have their I love you moment, obviously. And he's like, I want you to read to me again. And she's like, my books are in my bedroom. And he's like, I was hoping they were as she leads him into the house. It's just so charming of him. Wow. We get a happily ever after epilogue five years later where it's revealed that they reproduced. They spawned a child while Tiernan was still in college, but she still graduated a sleigh. And now they just go couples camping with Uncle Jake and Mirai and like Noah, who is alone. He just watches the child sadly in a separate tent. <laughs> we also learn in this epilogue that mom's name was Anna Lee. And then we also learn that she's dead of cancer just randomly. And they talk about like where to spread her ashes. Everyone smashes Uncle Jake and Mirai even get a bonus scene of their own on Penelope Douglas's website. And yeah, they're building a cabin together and we'll never be sad again. All things considered, it's like the most bizarrely normal happy ending that you could possibly imagine for a book like this. And yeah, that's the book. That's how this just absolute masterpiece ends. Yes. When I picked up this book, I expected it to be stupid and kind of camp and probably not something that I would personally be into, but still not an experience that would be an absolute plague upon my houses. For those of you who know my lore, my least favorite book of all time is November 9 by Colleen Hoover. And I think this ties it. Like, honestly, it might be even worse. I realized that while going through the book a second time for this video. There are just things that you see when you're deep diving into a piece of media like this that nobody, not a single human being can handle on their own. This video, for many reasons, it took years off my life, but at least now you never have to read this book. Okay, I promise you that I have told you everything you need to know. The next one of these will come at some unspecified date in the new year. I need to rest. I need to lay myself down in front of several different versions of God and beg for forgiveness from any of them. If you liked this video, please like it. Please comment. Please send this to your enemies in life to make sure that they don't sleep as easily as they once did. And if you like me, that makes one of us. You should still subscribe. Um, cool. Okay, I'm leaving. I don't have anything else to say. Bye!